Welcome back, everybody, to our next session of Day in the Park 2020. This one's going to be focused on computer science. We have uh, five fantastic speakers lined up for you in the next three hours. But before they get started, we have a few quick introductions. The first is from Greg Blaney, the director of the NASA Katherine Johnson Independent Verification and Validation Program based out of Fairmont, West Virginia, followed immediately by Dr. Murta Martin, the president of Fairmont State University. Hello, everyone. My name is Gregory Blaney. I am the director of NASA's Independent Verification and Validation Program located in Fairmont, West Virginia at the Katherine Johnson IV&V facility and I welcome you to this virtual Day in the Park event. First, let me talk about all the changes and challenges this COVID pandemic has brought to our lives. Yes, there has been significant changes and challenges, but I encourage you to look for the benefits and opportunities that came about due to the pandemic. I know that I've been experiencing and learning new ways of doing things. I've learned how to use new communication tools, I've learned that our employees can adapt and work from almost anywhere. And because NASA has been forced to move to more of a virtual operations for STEM engagement, like this one, we have actually been able to reach more people in more places. Therefore, I encourage all of you to focus on the new things you are learning to do and capitalize on them after this pandemic is over. In addition, one of the biggest things I believe we have all learned is that we can adapt and overcome. Let me talk just a moment about why I highly support NASA and Fairmont State University conducting events like this. I want every one of you students to know that you can be successful and secure a good job wherever you want to live. And one way to make that happen is to pursue a career in a STEM field. Obviously, STEM stands for science, technology, air engineering, and mathematics. Moreover, you can work for NASA and many other exciting places right here in West Virginia. If you do not believe me when I can say you can work for NASA or another government agency or a great company here in West Virginia, let me tell you a little bit about myself. I was born in Morgantown, West Virginia and live just across the state line out in the country between Point Marion and Smithfield, Pennsylvania. I grew up working on my grandfather's farm and doing carpentry work with my father. I did okay in school, but not really apply myself as I should have. I was more interested in playing football. However, events in my life provided me an opportunity to work for the Bendix Field Engineering Corporation at the Goddard Space Flight Center in Maryland. I started at the very bottom of the ladder because I did not have a college degree or much experience. However, I quickly learned that you could advance your own career through hard work and furthering your education. So over the past 40 years, I've gotten to the place where I get to work on NASA's most important missions, I get to see NASA launches. I travel to other NASA centers and get to see what they do there. And my boss is an astronaut. Yes, he's flown in space four different times. Actually, I've gotten to work with and become friends with several astronauts. So instead of waiting until you are older, as I did, decide to work a little harder in school. Get a good college education. Find a career you really like and then do great work for whomever you work for. In addition, do not forget, you can be flexible with your career. Do not be afraid to change or adapt to new things. Lastly, STEM fields are involved in almost all careers these days. In fact, almost all STEM fields are needed in NASA. If you're interested in aerospace, space science, robotics, computer science, software engineering, cybersecurity, energy, or climate, we need you in NASA. So I hope you enjoy this virtual event. I hope that it inspires you to do your best in school. I hope you pursue a career in a STEM field. And I hope we see you working for NASA someday. Have fun, have a great event, and thank you. Hello, I'm Dr. Mirto Martin, president of Fairmont State University. Welcome home. I hope that you're enjoying learning about STEM fields and careers today. There really has never been a better time to explore an interest in the STEM fields. Whether you're interested in robotics, aeronautics, and aviation, computer science, energy or climate studies, STEM fields are constantly forging new paths and innovating. 
It will be future STEM professionals, just like you, who help solve some of the greatest challenges and shape the future of our humanity. If you're interested in pursuing a career in a STEM field, the Airman State is your destination, whether you want to jump into a STEM career or go into graduate study. We have several academic programs across the entire spectrum of science, technology, engineering, and mathematics. Our state has so many bright students, just like you, who are interested in STEM fields, and we need you. And so I want to take a few minutes to talk to you about our programs, because we have some very special programs. Some of them are even the only ones of their kinds in our state. A STEM program, for example, that is unique to Fairmont State is our aviation program. It's our flagship program. If you've looked up in the sky and you have seen a maroon and white single engine plane, chances are that that's a Fairmont State aviation student logging flag time. We offer the only FAA 141 flight school program in the state. You can also study non-flight options like management, air traffic control, and security. Fairmont State also only has the only undergraduate and graduate architecture program in the state. Architecture is a unique STEM field that combines art and science, and it is an exciting career for creative thinkers. Yet another field that combines creativity, art, and science is graphic design technology. You'll not only take courses in art, in design theory, 2D and 3D design, and concepts of photography, but you'll also take tech courses like computer technology. Upon graduation, graphic te design technology students might find rewarding careers as graphic designers, web designers, technical illustrators, or desktop publishing artists. Our computer science programs have been specifically designed so our graduates can find employment in a variety of sectors. You can study to become a computer programmer, systems analyst, software engineer, or even work in cybersecurity. You might also choose to continue your interest in biology or perhaps chemistry. Fairmont State University has the latest cutting-edge scientific instrumentation and equipment, and you'll love it. And the great thing about studying biology or chemistry at Fairmont State is that you get to actually use the equipment, even just at the beginning of your academic career. At many other larger schools, you'll have to kind of wait your turn. Not so here. It's hands-on, no waiting. Another program where you get to use sophisticated equipment is forensics. While forensic scientists are the stars of many hit television shows, the career options are vast. Students often combine their forensic science degree with their love of chemistry or their love of biology. Forensic science graduates who go directly into the workforce often enjoy careers as medical examiners, criminologists, forensic anthropologists, forensic chemists, forensic pathologists, and yes, even toxicologists. Now let's talk about mathematics. Mathematic graduates have a world of career opportunities. Education, finance, manufacturing, cryptology, biomathematics, I can go on. Math professionals constantly break new ground and innovate every single field. A degree in one of these three engineering programs that we have here at Fairmont State makes use of your love of math and also of science. For example, civil engineering technology prepares you for a career where you plan, design and build things like roads, airports, tunnels, and bridges. 
Electronics Engineering Technology prepares graduates to work in a wide variety of industries. They make or use electrical and electronic equipment like communication systems, microcontrollers, advanced linear electronics, and advanced automation systems. Mechanical engineering technology students have fun, hands-on learning experiences. For instance, they design, they fabricate, test, and complete race cars, robots, and industrial designs at the nation's top engineering campuses. And after you graduate, you might go on to a lucrative career as data analyst engineers or perhaps even a project engineer. Another field that is housed in the Department of Engineering Technology is our occupational safety. This is an important field that makes sure that public and workspaces are safe. Upon graduation, you might find a career as an occupational health and safety technician, agricultural inspector, fire inspector, or even a building inspector. And oh, by the way, Fairmont State has the only occupational safety program in our state. In addition to our excellent STEM academic programs, we offer dozens of activities and events for students interested in STEM. One of those is the West Virginia Brigade of the Solar Army, a global organization dedicated to harnessing the sun's energy to make renewables fuel. There are activities that you can get involved in right now, and it's important that you do so. For instance, our online virtual math, science, and energy fair take place here in January and February. You could also get involved with Skills USA, a national technology competition, or first Lego League and your school's science fair. So you ask me, why is it important that you keep involved in STEM classes and in STEM activities? because you are the future of West Virginia. West Virginia, as well as the entire world, faces many challenges. And it will be up to students just like you, interested in STEM fields, to find the solutions that ails our planet. You are a generation of innovators, of problem solvers. You can turn your interests in same subjects to make West Virginia and the whole world a better place. I've given you a little bit of background at Fairmont State University, and I so in hope and pray that you enjoy the rest of your virtual day in the park. I invite you to explore our STEM programs and activities at fairmontstate.edu slash STEM. Welcome home to Fairmont State. We are so thrilled that you are joining us today and I look forward to seeing you very soon right here as one of our students. God bless you. Welcome to Day in the Park Computer Science. Uh, before I introduce our keynote speaker, Rich Finley, if you take a look in the description underneath here, there's a link to the computer science part of our Day in the Park website, as well as to a question and answer form. Um, as Rich and our other presenters are sharing information, if there are things that you wanna ask them, you can just fill that out and then I'll pass the questions on to them. Um, if you're on a separate device, that URL is bit.ly slash DIPQA. And so I really hope that we get some questions from our audience. Welcome to Rich Finley. Uh, he is, works at the NASA Katherine Johnson IVNV facility in Fairmont, West Virginia. And he is going to share a little bit about his work on the James Webb Space Telescope. Thank you, Rick. Rich. All right, thanks, Emily. Um, yeah, my name is Rich Finley. Uh, 
we'll go ahead to the next slide. All right. So uh, a little bit about myself. Uh, um, uh, grew up in West Virginia, uh, a very rural area of West Virginia, uh, lots of um, farms and agriculture. I uh, went to um, school to be a, I went to, I went to school, became an electrician, I went to trade school and I wasn't sure that, you know, college was in my future. Um, after doing that for a while, I liked it, but I, you know, I kind of get bored easily and wanted to know, you know, what is, what, what, what's the next adventure for, for me? So I decided to go, uh, you know, I'd try college and I found out I actually really liked it. Um, maybe, maybe a little bit too much. Uh, uh, I kept uh, going back. I graduated, worked as, um, worked for an electrical engineering company. I did that for a while and decided um, I really liked that. And, and that's where I learned uh, when I was, uh, they would have me do the programming for the electrical controls. And that's where I learned that uh, I really had this passion for, for software, for coding. And so I decided if, if, if that's what I like and that's what I'm doing, uh, I'll go back to school again and um, uh, for that type of work. Uh, the picture that Emily is pulling up now, this is, um, so this is a picture of uh, the clean room uh, where the uh, James Webb Space Telescope was being built. And uh, uh, the person in the picture with their hands raised up, uh, that would be me. They said, uh, uh, we'll take your picture, we'll take your picture, uh, do something so everybody knows it's you. And I thought, what in the world can I do when everything that's covered, everything is covered except for my eyes. So uh, I threw my hands in the air. I tried to, I tried to throw up a, a W and a V, a West Virginia sign with my hands. But uh, anyway, that's about the best I could do. Um, uh, but that's me in the clean room with the, as the telescope was being built. So a little bit uh, more about myself. Um, I still live and work in West Virginia. I, my hobbies are biking, snowboarding, kayaking, caving, camping. Um, you know, picture on top is skiing Colorado. On the uh, right is uh, cave exploration. Uh, I spent many years exploring caves and, and doing vertical uh, ascents and so forth in caves. I really like exploration. I think that's what draws me to NASA as well. Um, uh, my career, has always been software development and software projects. Um, uh, some of my uh, more notable ones are or, uh, work for the Department of Defense, uh, National Oceanic and Atmospheric Administration, NOAA, uh, as well as NASA. I'm currently a project manager at NASA. I work for the IVB program. Uh, I work on the James Webb Space Telescope and the Landsat 9 missions. Rich, we have a question from Joey. He's asking, what is the clean room and why is the telescope in one? Okay, so uh, great question. Um, when you're, when it, anytime you're building a, a spacecraft, uh, you have to build it in a very, very clean room. As a matter of fact, uh, this room that you're seeing here is the largest, um, cleanest room in the world. Uh, it, um, uh, well, you can't see in the picture, but there's a, there's an entire wall of filters on one side. And what that does, why you need that is because if, you know, we're building an optical telescope, if, if, if one hair got, in, uh, got onto the lens or onto a mirror uh, uh, before it got packaged up and, and, and launched into space, that could ruin all the pictures. And so uh, there's a lot of money, a lot of time, a lot of preparation spent to make sure when you build something, it, it's built clean. And it, now there's other NASA missions like Mars rovers where they have to make sure that it's clean because they don't want some kind of biology, some kind of uh, um, germ from Earth to end up on another planet. So that's uh, planetary contamination. And the first time I heard that uh, when I first joined NASA, I still remember sitting in a, in a, in a big meeting and thinking, they actually just said that. Like, I've never worked at a place where, you know, to me, that was like science fiction. So, yep, yeah, a lot of a lot of work on keeping things clean. All right, so what's a uh, great question, by the way. Um, getting into the mission, what is the James Webb Space Telescope? Um, so so uh, the telescope is it's, it's going to be a new space telescope that will see uh, much farther, much deeper into space. 
uh, you guys might have heard of the uh, Hubble Space Telescope, and I can imagine that if you've ever seen a picture in your science books of um, stars or planets or galaxies, uh, almost every picture in, in uh, student science books uh, came from the Hubble Space Telescope. It, it was pretty revolutionary for its time. Well, the James Webb Space Telescope is going to be the, the next one, the successor to Hubble. It's going to be is going to be able to see further, better resolution, see more, and see deeper into space. And, and just like Hubble, it's going to make discoveries uh, that we that we never even thought of. Um, so a little bit more about it. Uh, it was named after uh, NASA administrator James Webb. He was the administrator during the uh, moon landing, the Apollo uh, missions. Um, and, and during his time, he it was he was adamant about ensuring that while um, we have human exploration, sending people to the moon and Mars and, and so forth. He wanted a balanced agency at NASA to ensure that uh, that we also do science and we do discoveries for for the science area that we can um, uh, better human humanity back on Earth. Uh, next next slide, please. So uh, here's a picture of uh, James Webb on the left and Hubble on the right. And just for, uh, now these pictures aren't to scale, uh, just for a little bit of um, idea, uh, the Hubble on the right, uh, that's about the size of a school bus. Um, and James Webb is going to be much, much larger. All right, so, uh, so the mirror array looks like a beehive. Um, that uh, mirror array is, is going to be 20, 21 feet in diameter, so it's pretty big. Uh, it's about six times bigger than uh, the Hubble Space uh, Telescope mirror. Um, it's going to be significantly uh, larger. It's going to have um, going to cover 15 times the area of Hubble, and it's going to be uh, again significantly better resolution than any space telescope uh, uh, currently um, uh, currently out there. Rich, I'm sorry to interrupt. Can you just show us your shirt for a oh, second? sure. <laughs> <laughs> I love it. This, this is my proud uh, James Webb uh, t-shirt. So thanks. Um, <laughs> so um, I, another uh, point of reference for size, uh, the, the sun shield, which is the white part underneath the telescope, underneath that honeycomb array, uh, mirror ray. Uh, the sun shield is going to be about the size of a tennis court, whereas the whole spacecraft will be about half the size of a commercial 737 air, uh, airplane. Uh, so some more points of reference here. Uh, Hubble, uh, Hubble orbits the Earth, and and it's it's about um, 570 kilometers from the Earth, uh, whereas um, uh, James Webb will be about a million miles away from the Earth, uh, 1.5 million kilometers. So, and, and also James Webb will orbit the, the sun, just like Earth. Um, and so, so Hubble orbits the Earth, James Webb orbits the sun. Now, because it's going to, it's going to a, a very specific location in space called the Lagrange point two, uh, we call it L2. And this is a, a natural, it, this place naturally allows it to remain in orbit without a lot of uh, thruster control. And, and it, there's not too much maintenance to keep it in that orbit. Uh, but it also uh, is a really good place that's far away from Earth, far away from any kind of um, uh, um, interference from uh, radio signals or, or light. Uh, so that it can take uh, very crisp, clear uh, pictures. And the other thing, uh, because it's a million miles away from Earth, uh, this actually poses a, 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 a very big challenge where if something is wrong, uh, this is too far f currently for astronauts to, to, to have a mission to go fix it. And whereas Hubble had some uh, problems early on and astronauts have surfaced Hubble many times, uh, for James Webb, everything has to go right. It has to go right the first time. It has to, uh, we have to build build very safe systems, very safe software, and 
and redundancy. If one a system uh, fails, there's something. There's another way to do the same thing. So it, it's a very challenging project uh, because it'll be so far away, and it has to be autonomous. We can't we can't just go fix it. All right. So I was talking about pictures, pictures and science books. You might have seen uh, pictures like this. This uh, uh, the picture on the left. Uh, well, first of all, uh, this is uh, a picture of a, a beautiful nebula. Picture on the left is uh, taken with uh, a picture of visible light. Uh, it would be as if you, you know, the cameras that you are probably familiar with uh, take pictures in visible light, meaning that's the light that your human eyes can see. So you can see the beautiful uh, um, stardust and, and plumes, and, and this, is, this is an actual uh, uh, nebula out in space, and, and, and it's beautiful. Um, but scientists, when they, as much as they appreciate these pictures, they said, uh, after a while, they said, well, what, what's behind that? What's inside of it? What's behind it? Um, what is it blocking? What, is there something right behind it that, that, that we'd like to see? And so you can see on the, the picture on the left with visible light um, versus the picture on the right with infrared cameras and infrared light. Uh, infrared is, white, uh, is a light wavelength that is outside of the visible light spectrum. So our eyes can't see it, but we have cameras uh, and instruments that can. And so when we take pictures with infrared light, um, uh, basically it, what it comes down to is basically heat. Um, then uh, you, can, you can notice how many more stars you can see in the picture on the right versus the picture on the left, the same area of sky. So this is pretty significant because when we, before Hubble, uh, the, our idea of how many stars were in space um, was, was, was pretty small. And then when Hubble, uh, this, the discoveries made with Hubble, uh, we realized how many millions of stars there actually are. And, the, and, the, and one way we did that was we looked at areas of black space in between stars and Hubble was powerful enough to zoom in and actually notice that there's actually millions of stars in that little space. And now, if you can think of uh, the picture on the right, if you look at the black space in between those stars, James Webb will be able to zoom into that and uh, see more and more stars and galaxies. So it, it's a pretty powerful telescope. That is so cool. So if that's infrared light, how can we see the picture? So there's a lot of um, uh, software processing that uh, basically takes that infrared light, and because of measuring different wavelengths within the infrared light, it knows that that would be equivalent to this image, or it can pull out uh, uh, what those colors would be if we could see it. That's a general way, of, I guess, of, of saying that. That's awesome. Thank you. So like I said, it's powerful. As a matter of fact, uh, this telescope is going to be so powerful, uh, they say it can see back in time. Now, let me, let me walk you through this uh, so, you, so you can understand. Uh, uh, but in order to understand how this telescope will be able to see back in time, first we, understand, we need to understand how light travels uh, to us. So I don't expect you to read all this, but let me, let me just walk you through. Uh, light travels really fast. Uh, you probably don't notice when you turn off, you know, you know, when you flip the light switch in your room, the light just comes on instantly. But it actually takes a little bit of time to travel. It, it travels 186 miles per second. So if you are familiar with West Virginia, uh, basically, uh, if you if if you uh, flip if you turn on a light in Morgantown, it would it will have traveled past Charleston in one second. Um, so so it's very very fast. However, it does take some time. Um, the further away something is, obviously, the longer it has to travel to to, to get there. Uh, uh, for example, our sun. Uh, the light that we see from our when, uh, that travels from our sun, it, from where it starts at the sun, it takes 8.3 minutes to travel across this, across space and reach the Earth. And we call that um, distance from the sun to the Earth one astronomical unit. 
So uh, just as an example, if if you were to take a picture of the sun and um, it, if you were to take pictures of, of the sun, what you're actually seeing is a picture that happened eight minutes earlier because that light produced by the sun was traveling across space for eight minutes before it finally got to your camera. And whenever you look at the picture, you're looking at uh, the past. You're looking at a picture of something that happened at the past. So if there's any uh, uh, solar flares or uh, sunspots or anything like that, you're looking at that snapshot in time eight minutes ago. So uh, of course I have to say, don't stare at the sun. Don't take pictures of the sun. It can it can harm you. It can harm the can. It can also harm your cameras. Uh, I just wanted to use this as an example because everybody is very familiar with the sun and um, give you an idea of how uh, light travels across space. All right, so <laughs> so make sure nobody leaves this uh, presentation and goes out and tries to take pictures of the sun. Do not do that. All right, um, but I will get into uh, here about something you can do uh, a little bit later. Um, so because light uh, takes time to travel uh, and the further away something is, the longer time it takes, then um, it, it, it really, uh, um, the further away something is, the further back in time that light, it, the image of that, of what we're seeing actually happened. And so, um, uh, and, and so the older, it, it, well, I wanna make sure I, I lead you into this the, the right way. And, and I'm so excited, I wanna, I wanna uh, talk about the, the the really cool stuff first. So um, uh, we know that space. You know, everybody knows space is big, but it is really, really, really big. As a matter of fact, I, I, I told you, I, I discussed how um, light can travel from Morgantown past Charleston in one second. Well, space is so big that we measure distances in light years. You might have heard of light years. But a light year is how far across space light can travel in one year. So imagine, you know, across across West Virginia in one second, and how many seconds are an entire year? That's really far away. So things that are light years away are really really far. So it, it, a lot of the stars that we see um, are are so far away that their light that we're seeing took many, many years traveling across space before it ever got to us. So, um, so what this means is that James Webb Space Telescope, it's, it's very powerful and has very, very sensitive instruments on it that can see really, really faint light. And this faint light is so, um, it, it, it's so old and it's so faint. Um, because it has been traveling across our universe for for many, many, many years, and our te and this telescope will be able to see it and and show images of uh, of be able to take the infrared and, and turn it back into an image, and that way we'll be able to capture images of things that happened a long, long time ago. As a matter of fact, it can see so far back in time that uh, it will be able to see some images of some of our uh, first stars and galaxies ever as they are still forming. So it happened a long time ago, but we'll be able to see images of them actually, you know, they quote unquote being born. And so that's pretty cool. Um, so with that said, um, oh, actually, before I get into that, uh, what, the older the light is, as it, it travels across space, it gets stretched a little bit. And this is a hard, you know, this is kind of a mind-boggling uh, concept here, but but traveling really far across space, the light tends to get stretched. And what that means is it it, it has a redshift. It shifts into the red spectrum. So James Webb will be able to take that red light and measure it and know how old that light is. So it actually knows how far back in time that that light um, uh, from where it started, you know, uh, how long it, how long it's been traveling, and then it can use that to know how far away 
uh, something is or where it came from. So pretty neat stuff. Um, and and that, all, that all leads me into uh, the, this last bullet here. Um, when you look at the stars at night, when you go outside and look at the beautiful stars at night, uh, you're actually seeing back in time as well. These stars, uh, a lot of the stars are, um, you know, just like our star, the sun, our sun is a star, um, but they're so far away that we can actually look at the stars and it doesn't hurt our eyes. And when you see the stars at night, you're actually seeing light that happened a really, really long time ago. And it's been traveling for a long time and it's just now getting to earth, just now getting to your eyes. So you guys can see back in time too. All right. So what will uh, Webb look for? Uh, this telescope will look for the formations of stars and galaxies, like I was talking about. It's also going to look at is going to look for Goldilocks planets. Um, uh, if I were if this was interactive, I would ask you guys uh, who knows what a Goldilocks planet is. But I'll, what I'll tell you is um, that there's a there's a lot of people that want to know is there another planet that humans could survive on. And the number one factor for us to ever live on another planet, especially like, you know, people say, what if, what if, what if um, something happened on earth and where we needed to find another place to live? What if there was a big asteroid coming towards it? Whatever. Um, you know, we don't know of any of that, but uh, one day, you know, thousands of years from now, maybe that would be uh, uh, something we need. Goldilocks planet, the number one thing for humans to live on another planet is it has to be the right temperature. So there's some planets that are too far away from their star, uh, so they're too cold, and some planets that are too close to their star, they're too hot. So uh, James Webb will look for planets that are just right. They call those the Goldilocks, uh, Goldilocks planets. Um, and also look for black holes. Uh, I'm not going to uh, spend a lot of time on that, but black holes are very interesting. and, and um, it's going to look for uh, look for other uh, stellar events where you have stars circling other stars or, or galaxies uh, in unison uh, revolving around other galaxies, um, and and it's it's you know what I think is going to happen is it's going to uh, it's going to discover things that we never even thought to think of be, uh, uh, before, and that kind of leads me to my last bullet where. Um, you know, it's, it's, it's going to answer a lot, you know, our, our hope is that it answers a lot of astronomy questions that we have, but I think it's also going to present a lot of new questions that we never knew, we never knew. All right, so James Webb Space Telescope and Computer Science, uh, you know, how does this relate? So the computers manage the uh, operations for everything. They, they manage the spacecraft. Uh, the computers on the spacecraft manage uh, everything that's happening on the spacecraft. And it's kind of the brains of the operation. And there's also uh, computers on the ground that receive uh, the, the science data. They also communicate with the spacecraft, tell, you know, give it commands, tell what to do. Um, and there's also uh, uh, large computer systems that take the science data, process it, save it, and disseminate it across the world for scientists and, and general public and people uh, to use for science. This, is a, this mission is a collaboration of, of people all around the world. It's not just uh, NASA working on this. Uh, it is a NASA project, don't get me wrong, uh, but we have intentionally invited um, uh, agencies that are like the uh, equivalent of NASA from other countries to work to collaborate with us on this project uh, so that we could uh, um, improve humanity and, and when it's done everyone has uh, the rights to uh, see this data and so it's, it's really pretty neat collaboration. Um, so uh, NASA IVV this is where I work and uh, what the so, so it stands for uh, the Independent Verification and Validation Program. It's not NASA 4 and 5, so please don't say that. <laughs> uh, the, uh, what we do is we're focused on increasing the safety and reliability of uh, the computer systems and software uh, uh, used on NASA missions, such as James Webb. Uh, this, is, you know, this involves adding assurance that software will do what uh, is needed for the mission, a software you know, that they build it as planned, 
Uh, they built it right. They tested it right. They tested it well. And they tested it in ways to ensure that if something goes wrong, it will fail safe. So failing safe is very important when it comes to computer software uh, and computer design. What is uh, so? What is safe software? Um, so I imagine all of you have ever have have experienced a time where your computer locked up, you know, froze up, stopped working, or otherwise just did not do what you were trying to do. For most home computers tasks, if you're you know trying to log in uh, somewhere, uh, this is probably not a safety concern. It's it's while very uh, irritating, it, it's more of an inconvenience. Um, it's not you're not going to be physically harmed because your laptop quit working in most cases. Um, however, what if we're talking about a computer system that is running, let's say, an elevator? And what if, what if you're on the elevator and the computer quits working? What about an airplane uh, or a medical device in a hospital or, you know, closer to, to what I do, uh, you know, what if it's a spacecraft that an astronaut is, is on? And then uh, one problem that I always like to throw back at people at NASA is, uh, you know, because they are, a lot of people are so focused on what if the computer stops working? And I say, you know, what is worse? What if the computer remains working and it does the wrong thing? That can be even worse. So in these cases, it could be really bad. It could potentially harm someone. Um, uh, computer systems are, are, so that's why we, we build computer systems uh, so that they, they stay safe and we plan for things to go wrong. So while we, you know, in a perfect world, they never have to use these alternative um, uh, uh, designs, we actually build and design uh, safety measures into uh, computer systems and software so that if something goes wrong, uh, it will actually, uh, it would be okay. And, and it can, and it's still complete the critical uh, functions. As a matter of fact, uh, a lot of people don't, no, but when we landed on the moon, as 30 seconds, well, between four minutes and 30 seconds of touching down on the moon, there were uh, computer alarms and, and, and the software crashed and it crashed over and over again. And it was very important because it was the radar that told the astronauts how far from the ground they were and how, how high up they were. And, um, and, and you know, if you want to Google it and, and learn more, it's, it's out there on the web. But uh, but these things happen a lot, and it's really important uh, that we take measures to keep our computer systems uh, safe so we can have a successful mission. All right. Um, so uh, what is safe software? Uh, I kind of hit on it a little bit uh, already, but um, uh, basically, uh, Oh, I'm sorry. Uh, actually, what I, where I want to go with this one is um, why, why does the James Webb Space Telescope need to be safe? There's no people on board. Uh, the, it, it is a science mission. It's not a human uh, mission. So actually, it needs to be safe because it's so far away from Earth, um, people cannot uh, go fix it. And so where the previous examples that I was referring to, there was a human and a human could take over, uh, take over manual controls or what have you to fix the problem, uh, the, that option isn't available for James Webb. So we have to, uh, we have to ensure the software is, is very, very safe in order for the mission to be successful. Um, uh, we, it, has, it has to be uh, the, the software that we write and the systems that we uh, design have to be uh, very dependable, not only to work as um, expected, but we also want to make sure that there's never a situation where they work when they're not supposed to. And a good example would be the fire in a thruster. If if the rocket on a spacecraft suddenly turns on or turns on longer than we wanted, let's see, let's say it gets stuck on a stuck thruster, uh, and, and that's something that we actually uh, you know spend a lot of time. Uh, Focusing on is a stuck thruster that could that could push the spacecraft out of orbit uh, really fast, and we could not recover from that. So 
we have to have lots of um, safety measures in place. When I say safety, now I'm talking about mission safety, not human safety. So a lot of responsibility uh, for the software to succeed. All right, so, so again, I don't expect you to read all this, but I want to try to give you an example. Hopefully, uh, I didn't make it too complicated so you can follow along. Uh, but uh, I'm just going to use some pseudocode, pseudo meaning you know, not real, and give you an example of um, what software engineers, coders, and, and system designers have to, software architects have to deal with uh, to have safe code. So if you had a, if you, if you created a math function, I'm going to write a, a, soft, a little bit of code, and it's going to do a very small math function that's going to ask the user for a number, and the user will type in a number, and then it's going to say 20 divided by whatever number they give me, I'm going to give them the answer. So simple math problem, and you know, it's, it's going to be very convenient. They don't have to do the math themselves. Uh, if, and, and so let's uh, walk through some of the potential numbers and see how this works. Let's say that the user uh, types in the number 5. It's going to say 20 divided by the number they gave me, which is 5. 20 divided by 5. It's going to do the math calculation, and it's going to you know, give you a, a, an answer of 4. Let's say the user uh, uh, puts 10 uh, as an input. It's going to run the calculation, and 20 divided by 10, it's going to be 2. So that sounds pretty standard. It could even do uh, remainders and, and decimals and so forth. But what happens if the user, it asks the user uh, for a number, and at that point, it doesn't know what the user, it doesn't have any control over what the user puts in. Let's say the user puts in a zero. Well, for uh, software computations, if you, divide, uh, um, if you divide anything by zero, it can actually crash the system if the, if the software doesn't handle it. Uh, anything divided by zero could be an be a, a easy way to break code. Um, what happens if they enter a space key or a pound symbol or something that's not a number? Uh, when the software tries to read it, you know, it can it can have it can start you know, having really crazy behavior and do unexpected things. And so, what good programmers or coders uh, spend a lot of time doing is you know, first try to make it right, but uh, but then they have to uh, they have to um, Make it safe. So they so spend a lot of time writing code so that uh, so that no matter what happens, they if a user enters something they shouldn't, it'll ask the user please enter a valid number and 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 so forth. That way, it controls and protects itself uh, so that it doesn't uh, receive uh, it doesn't use a number that that's invalid. Um, real quick, I'm gonna try to hurry up here. Uh, Computer hackers, if anybody's interested in hacking, and that's a really great field right now to get into uh, uh, cybersecurity. Um, if you're interested in anything like that, a lot of hackers will take advantage of bad software developers where they don't write uh, protection into their code. They don't uh, look at the user inputs, and, and that lets hackers inject their own code as an input and make the software do uh, things uh, for them. Uh, so that can be really bad. And then um, my last point here is that good, good coders also make really good testers because they know what breaks software, so they can uh, make they can become really good testers as well. All right, and I'm getting pretty close to the end here. Uh, working at NASA, um, who does NASA hire? It is to me it is so amazing how uh, you know NASA is very very large agency. Uh, people all around the world and all around America. Uh, any job you can possibly think of, there is probably someone that works at NASA that does that job. Uh, doctors, accounting, uh, transportation, mechanics, welders. You're a really good welder. NASA uh, can, needs that person for something. So, uh, so if I don't want any students to think, uh, well, I'm not interested in the science or math or engineering. So I, I, I'm not interested. You know. Why would I ever work at NASA? Uh, education, teachers, uh, HR, any you know, contracts, anything you can think of. There, um, I can't uh, prove this, but uh, but uh, um, 
I've heard that there is a person that works at NASA and his job is to smell things. Because when people go up to the International Space Station, they want to bring some personal uh, things. And an example was uh, this guy wanted to bring a, 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 his favorite CDs. This is, this is a while back when people use CDs. And, and the, the plastic was too strong. And imagine being in a very tight spot and, and, and a strong smell of plastic. And so, so yeah, any job you can think of, even smelling things, you know, jobs you don't think of, uh, there's probably a place in NASA for you. All right, so real quick, uh, my, you know, where I fit in is, you know, for my job, what's really important. Obviously, software engineering and, and software development are my primary uh, skill sets. Uh, since I'm a project manager, uh, you know, that's important too. But also, uh, reading and writing communication. I, most of my days aren't running numbers and, and writing code. My, most of my days are, involve reading uh, documents of how things are going to be built or uh, what people are asking for in a system. Uh, reading and writing and communicate communication is so important because if I have somebody from NASA headquarters that wants to know how how well the software is, is coming along, I need to be able to to translate what the software developer that actually wrote it uh, where he is and be able to translate that into a way that someone that knows nothing about software uh, from you know uh, sitting in Washington D.C. at headquarters will understand. So. Communication and be able to adjust your communication for the right uh, uh, around the right people is so important. But uh, what I say, anytime I'm asked to to speak, uh, what I say is the most important skill uh, you can ever have in this for any job is uh, working well with people, being able to adjust uh, yourself to get along with different people, not to get them to adjust, but for you to learn how to adjust yourself to get along with every kind of person. And, and this, this can make a difference. Uh, uh, it, can, it can really help uh, you to be a successful person in any job, any career you, you uh, pursue. Um, obviously for NASA, good grades, college degrees, that kind of stuff is, is stuff they look for. Uh, and, and that can help you get your, uh, a really great job. But getting along with others is is going to be what what ensures you will keep the job. And with that, I will uh, open it up to questions. Hey, how long have you been working at NASA, Rich? So uh, um, it's been about seven years. I've been working on uh, NASA projects and, and space missions uh, um, quite a bit longer. Uh, but actually, uh, working at NASA, it's been about seven years. So you said that you get bored easily earlier. What is it about this job that has kept you interested for so long? Oh, it's, it's, it's amazing because, uh, uh, th there's always a new mission. It's always changing. Uh, I'm, uh, uh, even though the James Webb Space Telescope mission it has been, Gosh, 1990. It's it, it it it's it's been going on for um, longer than probably most of the students that are watching this. Uh, however, um, every phase of development is so different, and and then also my other missions like Landsat Nine, uh, you know, those are uh, continuing to um, uh, they change. So so. Yeah, I get bored easily, but this is a great fit for me because uh, the, what they say where I work is um, the only thing you can count on is things are going to change. So it kind of works out perfect. Absolutely. We had another question on the forum. Um, how do you brainstorm to come up with the problems that you need to avoid? Oh, that's a great question. Um, it, it really is, uh, depending on what phase you're in, if it's in the beginning of a project, it really is brainstorming, but what we uh, try to do is we try to uh, get uh, the right, we, we try to include people that have worked on similar missions, or let's say it's a brand new mission like James Webb, the technology wasn't even available when the, when the project started, we had to build the technology. 
but we get experts in areas of optics or lasers or whatever, and and we use uh, those subject matter experts, call them SMEs, SMEs, uh, to and we ask them what can, what can you think of that could go wrong, or what can you think of that is important for this to to succeed, and we do a lot of brainstorming, and then we try to put uh, everything, all the ideas into different categories and buckets, and and then we go from there. So are there people whose like specific job it is to try to break code or hack things? Or is that something where like, maybe that's what you do on Fridays? Yeah. Uh, different, different uh, uh, offices and, and different agencies and different companies all have their own approach. Um, but, but yeah, you can add, you can absolutely uh, get a job and, and in a position where your job is to go in and try to hack uh, NASA or try to hack a particular uh, system at NASA or uh, um, or if it, even if it's not NASA, uh, there there are lots of companies out there that your job, now you work for them, so, so you're not going to do anything bad when you get in there, uh, if you do get in, but they want to, you, they, you know, that's a really cool job to have because uh, you get to try to break things and then you tell them what you did so that they can go fix them. Absolutely. So there's code that's going to be on the James Webb Space Telescope for it to run. And then there's also going to be code analyzing the data that comes down from it, correct? So are you just focused on, on what's going to make it run? So uh, good question. Um, the, the software that is on the spacecraft it, its most important job is keeping the, the spacecraft safe and uh, keeping the communications alive so we can talk to it. Um, and, and it's it's fully autonomous. So, uh, which means that even if something bad happened and we wanted to take control, we can't we can't steer it like a you know, like a video game or or, or you know, we don't have joysticks. You know, uh, it's so far away that by the time we sent the command, whatever bad thing is happening. Could have it might be too late it takes a long time for the command to get there so uh, we rely on software on the spacecraft to to run it like an autonomous robot or a, you know self-driving car you know um and, and did that answer your question yeah absolutely okay. Okay. it sounds it sounds like a nerve-wracking job to me, Rich. Like I get nervous at these robotics tournaments when I see kids doing their autonomous programs, and that's much lower stakes than this. Yep, yep. <laughs> it's, but uh, I mean, it you know, it can it can be uh, a lot of pressure, a lot of you know things that I think about. You know, you know, sometimes keep me up at night. Um, but uh, you know, the way that you, you know, get more comfortable with it is uh, lots of testing, lots of uh, you know, going through and, 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 and trying to find ways to prevent uh, uh, th things that you know will work and so that you know that everything else won't work uh, or will be prevented. Well, thank you so much. I really appreciate you sharing your expertise and your time with us. No problem. Thanks for having me. Absolutely.
Welcome. Uh, we have Dr. Jennifer Robertson Honecker and Katie Baker from the WVU Extension Service. They do a lot of programs with 4 H. Uh, the program that they're going to show you today is Hack Your Harvest. If you haven't gotten the um, handouts for that already and the little uh, PDF to work alongside them, in our um, link to the page down below our website, you can find Hack Your Harvest on there hosted. Also, that's where you'll find the short URL for our questions and answers form. I'll be back at the end to ask a couple questions of our presenters if you Give me some questions to ask them. That's bit.ly slash dipqa. And Jen and Katie, take it away. Thanks. Awesome. Hi, Thank everyone. You, Emily. <laughs> yes, hi, everyone. Uh, I'm going to share my screen real quick and get us started. So, okay, so today, our activity is called Hack Your Harvest, and it's actually uh, an activity, it's a, it's a board game essentially, um, from this uh, kit of activities called Game Changers, which is part of something that 4-H does every year uh, called National Youth Science Day, but we've, we've changed the name, um, but it's, it's a really cool kit. So uh, Hack Your Harvest is from the one from last year, and it was all about efficiency and automation, um, you know, and how we can use automation and efficiency in agriculture. And what do we mean by that? So with automation, we mean, you know, how can we create programs or, you know, program machines to do things for us uh, without human interaction, you know? Uh, we can just hit go and they do it by themselves. So if you've ever done, you know, Lego robotics and you know when you hit the little orange button and the, the robot goes by itself that's that's automation um, and then the other side of that is efficiency we want our automation and programs to be efficient so getting the maximum amount of productivity um, with as little waste or errors as possible uh, and this is this picture here is um, some farming equipment where they automated harvesting lettuce which is exactly what we're going to be doing in our board game activity, Hack Your Harvest. Uh, so you can see all the wires and the metal machinery back there. Um, and normally people would, of course, pick this by hand, but with, with this kind of equipment, we can do it at a much faster pace and um, yield a lot more uh, lettuce. So as I said already, Hack Your Harvest is all about automation and efficiency. Uh, we're going to be programming a tractor to move across the board. And the goal is to move across the board in the best way possible, the most efficient way. Um, and how this simulates programming is, you know, every time you write a program or maybe you've done some drag and drop programming with Scratch or maybe you've done Tinkercad, every time you write a program, you're giving a computer instructions. You're telling it what to do, when to do it, how to do it. Um, and the other part of this simulating programming is that it, it introduces a really interesting problem. It's a math, it's a, it's a really, it's a common computer science problem um, called the traveling salesman, which we'll talk a little bit more about at the end after we've played uh, this activity and gone through some of the puzzles. Um, and at the end, we'll ask you guys to design your own puzzles and see if you have any issues or, or, or come up with some unique uh, solutions or efficiency or, you know, it'll be really fun. So with that, let's talk about what the actual pieces are. Uh, if you downloaded the, uh, the worksheet that Emily mentioned at the beginning, you should see this game board, which is here on the right. And our tractor will always start in the top left corner there. And uh, our goal is to get to the finish, to the barn. You know, we're we're running around our field, we're getting, we're getting whatever we need, if there's anything to get like lettuce, and then we, we want to end at the barn. So our tractor is the tractor icon on the left. We are collecting lettuce. Brambles are obstacles that we can remove with our tractor, and then boulders are spaces that we can't go on to at all. And the way that we are going to write down our answers or our program uh, is by using the arrow keys for movement and then the a little asterisk or star and then a dollar sign and i'll talk more about what those do in some of the later puzzles 
So the first puzzle is just using the arrow keys. So what do you think the most efficient or best solution is to get from where we are in the top left here to the barn? And I'll give you guys you know, a few seconds to, to write your solution down. So there are actually many different ways to solve this. Um, we could go down first and go all the way down into the finish. We could go down and over some. Uh, the one that I like to do is to go, oh, there's my answer, to go all the way over to the right. So I go to the right one, two, three, four, five, and then I go down one, two, three, four, five. So 10 steps in total. And, um, but some other different efficient ways could have been going down first and then over to the right, because those are the same amount of steps, right? So they're equally efficient, even though they're different solutions, um, which is kind of neat, because I think a lot of people think that if it's efficient, there's only one solution, but that's not always the case. You could have multiple ones. And depending on what you're trying to achieve in your situation, um, one might work better than the other. So we'll move on to the next puzzle. Now that we know how to move our tractor, um, across the spaces and you can't go diagonally. Can't go diagonally, you can only go up, down, left, or right. So, in this, in this puzzle, we're trying to get to the barn, but we have some obstacles in our way. Now, as I said earlier, the bramble blocks is something that you can cut away. So imagine if our tractor had sort of like a, a, a dozer blade and it can just remove that. Now, but the boulders, you can't go through. Those spots are just inaccessible. Um, so now with this puzzle, what do you guys think is the most efficient way to get to the barn? I'll give you guys another few seconds. And I am so sorry. I forgot to mention about these stars and the dollar signs here at the bottom, our code instructions. So if we wanted to remove the bramble, we have to uh, use the little asterisk, the star, and that cuts it away. And then we can move through and sort of bulldoze our way through. So if you wanted to go, if it was more efficient for you to go through the bramble, you could do that or you could go around it. Um, so which, which do you think is better? In this case, it's actually better to go around the bramble. Um, it's, it's more efficient that way because it takes, it takes a, we have to take a move or an operation to remove the bramble, which adds an extra step. So that makes it less efficient. So we just go around, we go, we can go down four, or I'm sorry, we can go down five and then go to the right five. Um, rather than going through the bramble, which would add that extra step, and then go down five and then over to the barn. Um, so some, some interesting things. You would, you would think originally that maybe going through the bramble might be the best option, but in this case, case it's not. What about this one? And again, I'll give you guys a 20 seconds or so to, to look at it. This one's a little, little harder because we have all these boulders here blocking our way and we can't do anything about them. Now, one of the fun things to do is to think through a couple different solutions. If you have your paper in front of you, you could actually try both, right? And think it through if you have a pencil um, and mark your, your steps and see which is more efficient. And remember that removing the bramble counts as one step. So if you want to, you can write just little numbers across each of your, your moves to see how efficient it is. So the less steps we have, the more efficient we are.
So in this puzzle, it's, it's more efficient for us to remove the bramble, which we do first. You can see the solution here at the bottom where we remove the bramble with our star operation, our dozer blade, and then we move all the way to the end and all the way down, which is a bit different. So that was 11 steps. And if we go around, how many steps is it? So if we go down one, over two, that's one, two, three. If we go up one, that's four. And then over three more, five, six, seven. And then if we go down five, we have eight, nine, 10, 11, 12. So it's one step extra, which is why it's, it's less efficient um, because we have to expend more energy time and effort to achieve the same goal. Let's <laughs> get a little bit. <laughs> so here we get to, here's where it gets a little, a lot more uh, interesting and uh, maybe a little bit harder. So here we have the traveling tractor and this goes back to the beginning where I mentioned the traveling salesman. Um, which is that really common computer science problem that is basically uh, how would you map or plan the most efficient route in a city for a salesman. Um, and so here we have two heads of lettuce and we want to pick up the lettuce. And our code instruction for picking up the lettuce is the dollar sign. Uh, we actually have to move to that spot to pick it up though. So if I wanted to pick up this lettuce on A3, I would go down three, one, two, three, and then I would use my dollar sign. So it would take me four steps to pick up that head of lettuce. Um, and the goal here is you have to pick up all heads of lettuce before you go to the barn and finish the puzzle. So I'm going to leave it here on this one a little bit longer and we're going to um, we're going to see what kind of solutions you guys come up with and, and think about, like Jen said, write it down um, because, you know, which, which head of lettuce do I want to pick up first? Do I want to get A3 <clears throat> or do I want to get the one on C4? Um, is, it, is it better to go across and then down or is it better to go down and then across? You know, and remember, you can't move diagonally. So take, take some time to, um, This one. And for this one, when you go to pick up the lettuce, remember you're going to use the dollar sign uh, to grab it. So that's an extra code. Uh, that dollar sign means you're grabbing the lettuce. Okay, I'll give you guys like 15 more seconds and then we'll, we'll talk about the solution. Um, okay, so for this one, we have more steps, but um, it's actually better to go get the, the lettuce that's right below you, or at least in the solution that I did, it's better to go down and get the first head of lettuce on A3. So I'm going to go down one, two, three. And remember, I have to be on the space where the lettuce is and then use the dollar sign. So that's four steps to get the first head of lettuce. And then I'm going to move over to the right twice and then up one to get my second head of lettuce. So now I've gotten everything I need to, and then I just need to go to the barn. Um, so it took me eight steps just to pick up these two heads of lettuce. And then I'm going to go all the way to the right edge, and then I'm going to go down three. So 14 steps in total. If anyone did it differently or, um, or did it in, or found a way to do it in just as many steps in a different way, that's awesome. Again, there could be multiple solutions. Um, that's kind of the fun, awesome part about these, these puzzles. Um, is that there are a multitude of ways to do them. 
Well, in this one, we only had to check two different paths, but if you had started with uh, the lettuce on C3, um, remember you would have to backtrack to get the other lettuce, right? And so that's why it ended up being a less efficient route for that one that was a little higher up. Right, yes, thank you. <laughs> so here we have two, we have two heads of lettuce again, but they're in two different spots. Um, or we have three, I'm sorry, zoom controls hid my, hid my last head of lettuce there. Uh, so we have three heads of lettuce here on A1, D4, and F6. Um, so again, just like Jen said, think about, um, you know, if you go all the way out to F6, you're going to have to come back to A1 and get the other head of lettuce. So what do you guys think the answer is to this one? So there are a lot more steps in this one than the previous one. You know what? Maybe I should go back. I should give you guys a few more seconds. <laughs> There's a lot of stuff to do in this one. Yeah, and if you know, you might notice that with each head of lettuce that we add, <clears throat> the number of paths and the complication, um, the number of steps required keeps getting bigger and bigger. So you should definitely have more steps in this one than you did in the last puzzle. Okay. There are 20, 23 steps in this solution, and I kind of hinted early, in a few minutes ago, but going down to get the one on A1 is better than going all the way to F6 and then having to backtrack, um, excuse me, and pick up the other heads of lettuce because you're going back over the same uh, spots that you already covered when you could have gotten the head of lettuce in advance. So. We go down, we get the first one that's right below us, and then we go up and over, up and over. We sort of do sort of like a stair stepping um, over to the second head of lettuce on D4. And then we do the same exact stair step up uh, to F6. So now, and then back down to the barn. To, solve, to, to complete our puzzle. Um, so that one was a lot more, it was a lot more complicated than previous ones. Why, why do you guys think that um, there were so many more uh, steps or options just because there were more heads of lettuce? Uh, we had lots more possible paths to take uh, in this one. In the previous one where it was just two heads of lettuce, you know, Jen said we only have, there are only two different paths to think about. But in this one with three, there were actually six. So we had four more paths to, that we had to consider. Um, and, you know, we probably don't consciously think about that. Our brains calculate that kind of stuff so quickly that, um, you know, we can just sort of look and be like, oh, I want to go here, here, and here versus, um, you know, actually writing out all different six solutions. But you could, and then you could compare and see which one was more efficient. Um, which is kind of like a, a pretty phenomenal thing that like our, our brains can do. So the last part of this is we've gone through some different puzzles where, um, you know, we had some rocks that you couldn't go through. We had some bramble that you had to cut. And then we had some lettuce that you had to pick up. 
Um, but if you notice, we didn't see any puzzles that had lettuce, bramble, and boulders all on one. And that is where you can have some really complicated, cool puzzles. Um, so this is where you can create your own. You know, you get to place where the, the bramble, the boulders, and the lettuce go. Uh, and, you know, sometimes I, I've seen a lot of kids where they, they want to put all the rocks in like one make like a box and, and put a lot of stuff on the board. But honestly, the less that you fill up the board, the more paths that are possible. Uh, so keep that in mind when you're creating your own because you don't wanna, you don't wanna fill it up to make it one impossible or two only have uh, one path available to you. So if you have a, a, a friend or a parent nearby, maybe you can make your own puzzle and hand it off to them and ask them to do the solution. Um, maybe they come up with a different solution than you. You can talk about, you know, which one was better or more efficient, um, which is pretty fun. That, that was, I love that part. So, um, I do actually want to go back real quick since we have the time. I think it'd be really cool to just show this video that I talked about at the beginning. Now that we've kind of gone through these puzzles, um, and uh, you, um, share your sound you might just have to yeah that's true good point thank you yeah um while you're setting that up i can share my screen really quickly and show something and you can perfect awesome all right so you got my screen yes okay. Yes, awesome. Okay, great. So um, one thing, so the, the resources for the um, activity we're doing today um, are not only shared uh, on the ERC's uh, day um, at the park uh, website, but if you go to National 4-H uh, website, they have facilitator guides and youth guides that really go into deep uh, a deep dive into this activity and some of the computer science behind it that Katie was talking about. And so what's really cool about that last puzzle um, that we did with the traveling salesman problem, which we're, we're calling the traveling tractor, is, uh, you know, really like all the thinking that goes into it as you add more pieces of, of lettuce that you have to collect. So when they talk about in the facilitator guide, which again is downloadable from National 4-H, um, you know, it says in puzzle four, there were only two routes that we had to check. But in puzzle five, if you thought about each one of those different heads of lettuce, that's six possible routes to test efficiency. And so you would think, well, what if we had four heads of lettuce? You know, would that be 12 different routes we would have to look at? Well, actually, no, there would be 24 possible routes to check. And if we put 10 heads of lettuce on the board, now again, it's a factorial, we're just moving up. We would actually have to check 3.6 million possible solutions if we had 10 heads of lettuce, right? And that's where this traveling salesman problem is such a big deal. Think about the things that we do, uh, the, the normal things that happen that require a lot of that decision making for efficiency, right? When UPS comes to drop off packages, Right? They, they use computer science in this way to find the best possible pathway to uh, deliver all those packages efficiently. Um, and air, light, or air flight travel, you know, to think about where a plane's going to go in their next flight, they don't just go back and forth between two cities. They're usually going from city to city to city. Um, and on here, it talks about sort of this, the math behind this problem. You know, if we were for our first solution, we were looking at only two heads of lettuce, A, B, or B, A, and then how that moves up as we go to uh, multiple heads of lettuce and the, all the different solutions we have to look at. So, you know, computer science in many ways are just really fun applied math problems. Um, and Computers for that last one, you know, if it's looking for 10 million, they also have to make their best judgment because it would take the computer program just way too long to figure it out if they had to find the absolute best solution. So sometimes they just kind of, um, what, do, what would we say, Katie, that they just uh, pick a, a group of what's the best instead of actually trying to do the best one uh, so they can get it done uh, quickly and in time. 
right? Think yeah, about it's an how, approximation. Yes, there we go. Right. Think about, you know, how many times have you been in the car with your parents and you missed the turn? You know, you're following the Google Maps and all of a sudden you miss the turn and recalculating, recalculating, right? Same kind of thing there. It's trying to get you back on uh, track in a timely manner quickly because you're still driving, uh, but also efficiently so that you don't have to go 30 minutes out of your way when you've missed your stop. So just wanted to show this again, this is available online uh, for National 4-H uh, for the kit game changers. And I'll kick it back to you, Katie. Awesome. Yeah, we'll see uh, some real life application of um, what we just talked about. So you guys see my screen? Yes. All right. Um, let me know if that's too loud or. This is the old way of harvesting lettuce. Tedious and unbelievably backbreaking. And this is the new way. Meet the automatic lettuce harvester. Hear that? That's the sound of water knives. Ultra high pressure blasts that cut through the plant, which is then escorted up to workers who trim and sort it. You're using less effort because you don't cut, you don't um, bend over. It's really much easier. More and more, the machines are assuming control over our food production. After all, humanity has to feed its ballooning population using the same amount of land. Here in the Salinas Valley, about an hour and a half south of San Francisco, farmers and tech types are joining forces to turn this place into a kind of Silicon Valley for agriculture. Their quest is to make farming more productive and more efficient, not just for the Salinas Valley, but for the world. That means more automation and even a special variety of lettuce that's easier for the machines to cut. So essentially what we're doing is we're changing agriculture to meet the, the labor need on the harvest side. Yeah, so about that labor. This machine requires half of the workers you'd need to harvest the old-fashioned way, which means somebody's going to lose their job, right? Not in California. It's got itself a labor shortage. Here in California, we've got uh, an aging workforce. We're not getting that younger population into the job. Not only that, but the number of immigrant workers has plummeted. While automation will no doubt put people out of work in other industries, for California's farmers at least, it may be the only way they can make it in a changing economy. Planning ahead for the future, it's important that we're ready to have fewer workers. So for now, the answer in Salinas is more robots. In a Taylor Farms processing plant, it's the machines that do the heavy lifting. This gadget does quality control, automatically detecting crummy lettuce and blasting it out of the system with a jet of air. A robot even does the packaging, far quicker than a human could ever manage. Okay, so they're not perfect, but all in all, from picking to boxing, a human hardly ever touches the product. That's good for both food safety and efficiency. We still need people. Um, I think we're always moving down that automation track. I don't know if you get to full automation. There's a science around agriculture, but there's a bit of an art to it as well. But I think in terms of getting rid of the hardest part of the jobs, I see that continuing. And over in downtown Salinas, the Western Grower Center for Innovation and Technology nurtures startups that increasingly mechanize and digitize agriculture. At the end of the day, a lot of the traditional work that's being done in the fields, uh, fewer and fewer people want to do that. So parts of those functions simply are going to be automated. And, and that's not necessarily any, anything new. In agriculture these days, technology isn't just filling jobs humans aren't around to do, but jobs humans can't do. Take this doohickey from a company called Agridata. It uses machine vision to eyeball plants. Drive this thing through your trees and it automatically detects fruits to predict yield. Have a human try to do the same and a month later you'll have broken their mind. This new green revolution is all about data. Anything farmers can get that'll make their operations more efficient, especially here in California, which just pulled through a crushing drought. So in the hills overlooking Salinas Valley, Han Family Wines has teamed up with Verizon to test a sophisticated water monitoring system. With our soil sensors, we're measuring how far down that, that moisture is going. And you know, if it's gone out the bottom of the soil, uh, then we know we put on too much water so we can cut back. With climate change messing with rainfall all over the world, farmers have to get smarter about their water use. Looking at and all the tools uh, that are out there is going to help us be more efficient all the way through. And it's not just here. Ag tech is exploding around the world. Because the old way of doing things just won't cut it anymore. All right, 
So that was kind of kind of cool, kind of neat. Um, if you notice, there were a lot of different places where they mentioned automation, efficiency, um, the device was called an automatic lettuce harvester. Uh, and they talked about, you know, using efficiency in terms of uh, monitoring water usage. Um, they showed a quick picture of uh, a car plant where, you know, they were, you know, machines were putting together cars. Um, this also applies to lots of smaller things like uh, your, your PlayStation or your Xbox, you know. There's probably a manufacturing plant where machines have automatically put those pieces together. Um, so it doesn't just apply to agriculture, but we wanted to focus on agriculture in this, in this activity. Um, but it's really worldwide and uh, this kind of concept, this um, manufacturing automation efficiency uh, applies to um, everyday life. Your coffee maker, that's automatic. You know, you program it to maybe make you coffee in the morning that when you get up before you go to work. Um, there are all kinds of small little things. An alarm clock, that's automated. Um, so it's kind of neat and, and a bit crazy to think about all the ways that technology has um, made our lives more efficient to give us more free time. You know, we're not working a field for eight hours a day, you know, that kind of thing, um, which is kind of neat. So I think that's really it, unless you have anything else to add, Jen. Nope, I think this is great. And I know that um, the only last thing I was going to add about automation that sometimes people, you know, they mentioned it briefly about taking jobs away, um, mm -hmm. which typically, you know, they talk about the three D's of automation and robotics, which is taking jobs that are dangerous, dirty or dull. So um, that tends to be the, um, the main driver uh, behind roboticizing and, you know, um, automating these types of, of jobs. So um, Emily, I don't know if we had any uh, questions or comments sent through. I just, I love that Hack Your Harvest really focuses on how there are multiple solutions to all these problems. I think computer science gets a bad rap as being just kind of automatic and dreary a little bit, but it is such a creative enterprise to try to find a solution that meets the parameters and also does it efficiently. And I I love how Hack Your Harvest captures that. Um, if you two would both just talk a little bit about your jobs and what you do and how you got there and what you like. Do you, do you want to go first, Jen, or? Sure. And, and you know, and, and um, Emily, your last comment also um, just gave me a little reminder. You know, if you really like board games, you can actually take many of your board games and turn it into a computer science game too, right? Think about the way that you're, you're playing your game, how you could make it into solutions and steps which require instructions just like we did here, um, where you have that player come up with the efficient route to do that. And then the more things you add in there, like, you know, dice or others, um, those are actually adding even more complexity into that game. So I challenge those of you out there, take some of your favorite board games and see if you can turn them into a fun computer science game similar to Hack Your Harvest. So yes, I'm um, Dr. Jen Robertson Honecker. Uh, I am the STEM specialist at West Virginia University's Extension Service 4-H um, Youth Development Program. So um, I'm actually a chemist by training. I was a public school teacher, um, went back and got my PhD in chemistry. I, would, I taught chemistry at WVU for several years before I moved into this position. Um, and I love this, the job that I do because I, I continue to get to to do STEM. I love science. I love chemistry. I love to learn new sciences like computer science, um, but I still get to work with kids. Um, and uh, what's great about my job is that, you know, it's not just, you know, I was teaching high school science and then I was teaching college students chemistry. And now I get to work through from kindergarten to college and I get to train teachers. So um, it's a really fun job. Uh, and I love to learn. So tonight we're going to be running activities with 4-Hers uh, around Mars. So I'm constantly learning um, and just um, getting to see kids learn too, which um, when they get have their aha moments, it's just wonderful for me to see that. So that's what I do. <laughs> I love that. Um, so yeah, I'm Katie Baker. I'm the computer science innovator for West Virginia University Extension Service 4-H Youth Development Program. 
And my background is actually in computer science. And when I'm not working with kids or 4-H, um, I make video games. Um, so it's appropriate that my background is Mario. Uh, I love taking computer science and making it fun. Um, I love what you mentioned, Emily, about how, you know, there are multiple solutions. When I was learning computer science, my dad always taught, like, he always told me that um, writing programs was like art. You know, you get to write it however you want in whatever way you want. And I've also heard other people say that, um, you know, algorithms and other computer science components are like recipes, you know. Uh, you might have the main components, but, uh, you know, the way your grandma makes it is not going to be the same way that maybe you make it, even though it's the same stuff. Uh, so, so I love working with kids as well. I, I was also one of those kids that needed that kind of encouragement and aha moment um, from role models and mentors and peers. Um, and so I just love having the opportunity to give that back. So. Think about it. That would be fantastic. I love how you both emphasize the social aspect of it too. And I'm not sure if you got to see our keynote, but Rich really talked about that too. I think that's another misconception about computer science that you're like sitting alone by yourself, just working on your computer, but that's not, that's not the case for a lot of jobs in IT. It's very collaborative. It's very, um, sometimes it can be hive mind ish almost, but, um, it's a very collaborative space, which is really cool. And I think overlooked sometimes I, I would agree with that. Absolutely. Well, thank you both so much for your time and for sharing Heck Your Harvest with us. That is such a fun activity to do. Um, everyone who's watching on our live stream, we're going to get ready to do a Kahoot. So if you need to grab a device or get another tab open and head over to Kahoot.it, we'll get that started in just a minute. Absolutely. Um, WVU Extension's 4-H program every year runs a code camp. Um, typically that camp, um, it's in February, typically it's a weekend overnight camp. Um, and we were very fortunate to be able to have that in 2020 because it was prior to COVID. Uh, this year we will be running it as a virtual event, but it's going to be just as hands-on and interactive. Um, so it is for middle and high school students. So that will probably be um, going up on WVU Extension's 4-H um, website in December if people are interested in registering and being a part of that. So it's for anyone who's brand new to coding, to those that, you know, have already done, you know, up to text-based and want to further that learning. So um, hopefully we'll see some of you, uh, virtually see some of you uh, at our code camp in February, 2021. Just going to share the um, extension website in case you haven't had a chance to go there before. It's just extension.wvu.edu. And there's so much great information about the cool programs that you guys run and are a part of. So definitely want to check out and we'll make sure to get that up on our website as well. Thank you, Emily. I really appreciate that. So yes, thank you. Hey, thanks for having us. We, we had a good time. Thank you both so much.
All right, everyone, we'll be starting another round of Kahoot. All you have to do is on any, any device that you have, whether that be a tablet, an iPhone, an iPad, um, a computer, PC, Mac, it doesn't even matter. Uh, all you have to do is join any browser with this web link, or you could just enter kahoot.it and enter this game pin at the top. I'll give you guys a couple minutes to log in. Today's Kahoot, or the session's Kahoot, is about computer shortcuts, specifically PC computer shortcuts. So I apologize if you only lived by Mac your entire life, but I promise that we will redeem you later. We only have three players in here. What about we increase that number? Join at kahoot.it with game pin 5548687. We'll be starting in a minute from now, so please, please join before we can so you can get bragging rights. You can tell your friends, oh, I want a Kahoot game with random strangers on the internet. I'll give you guys 30 more seconds and then we'll head on into this queue. Oh no, we lost a player. Sad. Well, we will be starting in three, two, oh, they're back. We'll be starting in three, two, one. What do you press if you want to save your files? Say you uh, are on a PC and you just finished a very long essay. What do you press if you want to save it? You want to make sure you don't lose it. Control S. Seems like everyone got that, that answered. How do you close a window? <laughs> Not the window at your house. Closing that window is easy. You just press down on it. But closing a tab on your computer. Control W. That is how you close your window. I actually did not know that. We have everyone on the leaderboard. This is my absolute favorite shortcut. It makes my life a lot easier. <laughs> it 
it comes in handy when I, I'm doing some research on stuff. Focus Jack in the lead and on fire. Let's see if he can keep this lead. How do you take a screenshot without snipping tool? Windows logo and print screen. Alt shift print screen. Control Alt eight or is it even possible? <laughs> Screen. Oh no, not focused. Yeah, Mystery Acting taking the lead, followed by Glowing Camel. It's a very tight race for first. What is the shortcut to take a screenshot if you do not want to use the snapping, the snipping tool? to Windows print screen. Glowing Camel, overtaking Mystery Raccoon. We have two questions left. You just deleted your whole paper. What can you do to get, get it back? Do you cry? <laughs> Press Control C, Control D, Control F. Or sadly, it's gone forever. No, it's not gone forever. You can press Control Z. Going camel on fire. We are into our last round. How do you copy and paste? Probably my most used feature on uh, any computer. I copy and paste all the time. This is one of the most helpful, helpful shortcuts to know. Control C and Control V. Don't know why the V is there, but Control C stands for Control Copy, in my opinion. In third place, we have Focus Yeah. Followed by Mystery Arcoon. And in first place, Drum Roll. With 5,627 points, we have Glowing Camel. That is it for this round of Kahoot. Please tune in, in uh, after the next session or the next round of Kahoot. It was a wonderful being your, your host. Welcome back. We are getting ready to have uh, Bobby Mitchell, who I have the pleasure of working with in the NASA IV and VERC office. 
to show off some of our NASA scratch debugging studio. Since our office, um, the IVNV does software verification and validation and looks for bugs and tries to figure out ways to make programs work better, we thought it would be nice if we had a scratch studio that let kids practice with the same thing. So I'm just going to show you how to get there. If you haven't already, head down to the description underneath us and click on the link that says sites.google slash day in the park. Um, there's more stuff in there, but you know what I mean. And then if you hover over sessions, you can go down to computer science and click there. Once you are on the computer science page, this is where those hack your harvest instructions are if you want to do more of that. Um, and then just under it, it says code debugging activity. And this is what Bobby's going to be showing off. So if you want to be doing this alongside her while she's talking through these programs, this is the fastest way to get to that place. Okay. And I will let Bobby take it from there. She is an amazing AmeriCorps Vista in our office, and she will be telling you all about our Scratch Debugging Studio. Hello, hello. Like she said, my name is Bobby. Let me just go ahead and get my screen pulled up. Um, feel free to do these activities alongside. Uh, if you're if you're concerned, like, well, now I know how to solve them. If you watch me go through them. As we've learned throughout the other uh, presentations we've watched today, there are multiple ways to go through programming things. There are multiple ways to debug things. So uh, today we'll be using Scratch, scratch.mit.edu. It's a super fun tool. You can use it to not only make games, but you can also use it to program uh, robotics and whatnot. You can like program EV3s and we do robots. And so you can do all kinds of stuff with this. So the first one that we are going to look at is the shooting star. So we just click on that and it brings us up to this page and we have like a little instruction prompt and then we can actually run through the code and see what's going on. So as the instructions say, you press the green start flag and then you watch and you'll see Kieran moonwalk and then uh, a shooting star lands at her feet. So she goes and she picks it up, but then it doesn't go away. So we can watch that. And we can watch Kieran go and pick up the star, but oh, it's over here now. But she picked it up. So clearly it shouldn't be over there. So we can stop and watch it again just to see what happens. And again, it's somewhere new now. So we need to remix the program and find the error and see if we can fix the problem of the star disappearing. So if we click go inside, now we can see all of the code. So a few important things with this area. This is the coding area. Um, as I was talking about earlier, you can use different plugins to code like EV3 and stuff, but we're not going to be doing that today. Um, over here, you have all of your code blocks. You can scroll down. You have like motion and different events. You can have control with loops and whatnot. And then if we want, we can also look at some of the costumes. I'll be looking at some of these later. We can look at different Kieran's and whatnot. And then over on the right side, we can see our sprites. So we have Kieran, and then we also have our star that we see pops up whenever it falls to the ground. And when we click on these sprites, we can also see the code. So this is Kieran's code, and then this is the star's code. Something else that we can see when we press start, some of the code lights up. That's the code that's running right now. And so we can see that this uh, lit up and then this lit up. These blocks at the top are also start blocks. So if we don't have code underneath of it, this code won't do anything. So the issue that we have is that the star is not disappearing. So if we look at the star, when I receive pick up star, that's whenever she picked up the star. Well, what's happening? It's going to a random position is what we can see here. So to see if this is actually the little issue area, maybe we can change it to, it'll go to Kieran. And then try running that and see what changes. And as we can see, it just kind of whoop, went straight up to her. So something that we can do instead is we can pull this bit of code out and then we can hide the star. So now whenever I, receive pickup star, it will hide the star instead of showing it in a random position. 
So we can try that again. And then now she picks up the star and it disappears along with her. We're going to go back and look at some of the next one now since we have fixed that one. Also, you don't need to make a scratch. As you can see, I'm not signed in anywhere. You don't have to make a scratch account to do these. So the next one I want to do is dot digs. So this one, we need to get dot to stop digging. And if we watch, and then we can see dot move around. And she's digging holes, and we don't want her to be doing that. There's, there's already enough holes on this moon base we don't need anymore. So we can go ahead and look inside. And then we can see Dot moving around and digging more holes. So if we look at some of this code, this is a green flag, and then this is also a green flag. So both of these lines of code start at the same time whenever we click Start. And if we look at this one, we'll go ahead and stop and press Start. We can see that dot, we can see dot's location. And dot's location is the same as this. So this tells us that this bit of code just moves dot to this initial location at the start of the program every time. So this shouldn't be too much of a worry. What we're worried about is dot digging all of these holes. So if we look, we have a big forever loop. So dot will dig up this entire moon if we don't stop her. So she waits for seven seconds. And then we set a random position between per, like these two parameters. So for our x, negative 202 to positive 202, and y to negative 100 to negative 19. So this just means Dot can only dig on the moon. Because it'd be a little goofy if Dot could dig up in the sky. We also have uh, where Dot glides. And then um, this is the walking animation. Because if we look at the costumes, we can see those are the little sprites of Dot walking back and forth. And these are switching costumes between those. So this doesn't really tell us too much. So we can go over to Doug. And as we can see, when we click Start, then it waits and then it creates a clone at Dot. It creates a clone and then when I start as a clone, it goes to dot and it makes a clone. So something that we can try is we could delete Doug or we could just remove this code from these little start blocks. And so now there's no code to actually uh, dig the holes. Now we can wait and see what happens. And now we have dot like sliding over to places and digging around. So we could leave it here because Dots is no longer able to dig holes, but I don't slide around places. Do you? I, I walk places. And so I want to give Dot a walking animation really quickly. And so since this is like a, it repeats, um, and we know it's switching between costumes, we know that this is her walking animation. So we can actually pull this out. We'll leave this in here. And but now what I do, what, what do I do with this? So something that you do in a lot of coding is you look at previous code. You can look at other people's code. Um, there's a website called GitHub where people go and they look at chunks of code to see how they can implement uh, that code into their own. And so something we can actually do is we can go back and let's take a quick look at Kieran again and look at her walking animation. And so when I receive walking, we have the repeat and the switching between the costumes. And then over here, broadcast walking and then gliding. So something about coding, it, uh, the animations go in the order that you put them into the code. So if we put the gliding somewhere like above the broadcast, then Kieran will glide over to whatever area before actually doing the walking animation. So something that we can take from this code when I receive walking and then the broadcast.
So we're going to go back to dot. And take another look at that again. I'm going to go over to the hole because we already know we need to pull this out to stop the holes from forming. And then we can pull out this repeat. Go ahead and put that over there. And then we need that event. So when I receive, we'll go ahead and call it walking again. And then broadcast. Remember, we're going to broadcast this before the glide. And so let's try it again. And now she walks over to the hole. And she walks a little bit extra, a little too long. We can uh, adjust some of the times for that. So like say, we'll only repeat six times. And then cut the times that way. But now we have dot walking over all over the moon instead of digging holes all over the moon. All right, so we will head to the next one. The next one I would like to look at is bugs in the classroom. So this one we'll have to remix and change the code so that the bug doesn't escape and take over the lab. So if we click start, NASA uses clean rooms to protect sensitive equipment and experiments. Scientists wear special gear and follow important directions to keep their clean rooms clean. This clean room has a live specimen in it that is being used for an experiment. If the specimen is exposed to the environment, it will replicate and take over the lab. Your task is to keep the bug from escaping. But here's the thing, we can't just delete the bug. It's an important part of the experiment. So if we just got rid of the bug, that would defeat the whole purpose. So let's see what happens. We're walking over to check on the specimen. And oop, we broke it and we released everything. So we'll go ahead and stop that. We don't want all those bugs everywhere. And we will take a quick look inside. I'm going to move this down here so we can see all this code because this one's got all kinds of stuff going on. We've got like all kinds of costumes. We've got all kinds of code. We've got a whole bunch going on with the bug. We have the tank here. We also have the start button. I don't think anything happens with this has anything to do with the start button. So we're going to leave the start button alone. So we'll go ahead and press play and watch the code. And we see that's going through. Uh, this is tilting the sprite. So that's the walking animation for Ripley. And we can see where he says, oops. And then where he points up. But then we have this if then statement down here. If close equals one, then we switch costume to Ripley A, which if we look at costumes, he's smiling. And then we say that was a close call, but this is a little bit, this is, this is a little too close. So something that we can do, we need to set close equal to one to have him say this was a close call. So we'll go ahead and look at variables because close is our variable and we have set close to zero, change close to one, all that. So we will take our set close to one and put it above the if statement. And we'll go ahead and change that to one. So now we have close equals to one. So hopefully we'll say this is a close call, even though we already know that it's not. <laughs> but running the code will show us what we changed and give us an idea of what else. So now he's standing up and says that's a close call. It'll give us an idea of what else we need to work on. So now we have the issue of the bug going absolutely everywhere. So we can go and look at the bug. We can read when clicked, when I receive break. That's an important part because that's whenever the glass breaks 
and releases the bug. So when I receive break, it starts creating clones and it's repeating that 10 times to create clones of itself. So something we can do, we can pull out that code so that uh, the bug doesn't start um, re like making clones like crazy. Because if we look at some of this other code, when costume is greater than 50, so when there's a whole bunch of clones, then uh, this bit of code will trigger. And then when I start as a clone. So if we don't have clones being created, then hopefully this part won't trigger. So we can go ahead and press start. Oop. That was my bad. Okay, so our glass is still breaking, but the bug is not exploding everywhere. So the last bit we need to look at, I did something with this, but the last bit we need to look at is the glass breaking. So this is another when I receive break. So if we remove that bit, then we do not receive break. Something else we can also do, another way to solve this, is we could just pull out the broadcast. So by pulling out the broadcast, we don't even have to go through and find all of the other areas where break is located because it won't broadcast that uh, statement. So go ahead and press start. We have Ripley going up, he falls. Oh, but our glass does not break and the bug does not replicate all over the lab. So now we have a much safer lab, although whatever he tripped over definitely needs to be picked up because you cannot have a messy lab. And like I said, you could pull out this broadcast or you can go through and find all of the spots where um, the code receives break and remove that. Or you could even just delete these lines of code. I don't like to delete lines of code though because then what if you delete the wrong bit? You can always, as we learned a second ago, press control Z and undo it, but I'd rather just pull it down and then see what happens um, from the small changes rather than make large changes. So we'll go ahead and go back. And then the last one that we are going to look at is the rocket launch. So we're going to initiate the rocket root boosters by pressing the space bar excuse me, and then watch the rocket launch and observe what happens. So the goal is to reach orbit on this planet, which is outside of the box. So hopefully we won't see the rocket anymore. So let's go ahead and press play and see what happens. And if we press space in five, four, three, two, one. I don't know about you, that is the saddest rocket launch I have ever seen. He just went and just like hopped up in the air a little bit. We have this rocket position, so when we press space, we can see how much our rocket moves, and it's not that much. It's only moving about 50. So let's go ahead and look inside. The only sprite we have this time is the rocket ship, which simplifies everything, especially when this code is so small. So. We have this, so this tells us where our rocket ship is whenever we press start. So when we press start, we go down to negative 23, negative 157. So this is just like the initial code whenever we press start. And then we have to press space to trigger this bit. So if I press start, nothing happens until I press the space bar. And then as you can see, this lit up. So this is the code that we're mostly going to be uh, looking at. So if we look at the costumes, because we switched to rocket ship A, we have all these costumes. Rocket ship E has nothing. That's whenever the rocket is initially going off, as we can see right here. But then we have all of these ones that make the rocket spin as well. So we're going to keep that in mind. But our main focus is getting the rocket off screen. So um, as I said earlier, when we change the rocket or whenever we press space and launch the rocket, 
we can watch the y position and see it only changes by 50. And that's this change by 50 um, line of code right here. So something we could go ahead and do is say, let's change that to, let's change it by 200. Let's just make it a big number and see if we can get this rocket off screen. We'll press space. And our rocket hopped up. And this is like the walking. I don't walk by sliding and rockets don't get to space by flipping up there. So you know what? We're gonna make it glide instead because that's not how rockets work. So if we look at our motion, we can glance around and we can see we have some glides. So this is has your um, sprite glide for one second to a random position or your mouse pointer, but that's not exactly what we're looking for. This one has glide from one second to, and you give it a coordinate. So this is a little bit more of what we're looking for. So we can have a robot glide for one second to, and then we don't want our rocket to go left and right. So we wanna keep our X axis the same, but our Y axis definitely needs an update. So once again, we'll just put in a big number. We'll say 200 again, and then we can look and see what happens. Press space to start. And then we have a rocket gliding off into space. Cool. And still not quite there. Also, we can take blocks and drag them over to the left side to get rid of them. I'm going to make this a little bit bigger. Let's say, I want to say 300. I'm going to make it take a little bit longer so we can actually see the rocket. We're going to say five seconds. And then I was looking at these costumes. And I think these costumes are cool. And I think it would be really cool to have our spaceship spin while going up into space. And so, if you remember that walking animation from earlier, we have, in our events, we have broadcast. And so, remember, we have to have broadcast before glide because, um, actually, I'll show you what happens if we put the broadcast after. And so, our new message is going to be blast off. And then I'm going to make this lower so you can see what happens after the glide. Put it back to its original area. I didn't make it lower. And then when I receive blast off. And so if we remember from earlier, we had a repeat. And then we had our looks. So switch costume. And then we also had a wait. Oop, here it is. So wait for one second. We're going to make this a little bit smaller. I'm going to say 0.1. And then actually I'm going to put this on top. Something else that we can do, we can right click and then we can duplicate. So now we have another and another Oop. and another. So now we don't have to keep duplicating or going through and pulling out the same blocks so that we can change this to the different uh, rocket ship um, costumes. So now we have our blast off with our spinning rocket and we also have our rocket gliding up. And I, like I said, I'm going to show you what it looks like when you put the broadcast after the glide. Mm -hmm. So we have our sound, and then we have it gliding up, and then it just starts rotating. So since the code goes through in the order that it's put in, if you put the blast off in last, then it won't trigger until it's done gliding. So we'll go ahead and make this that big 300 and try it one last time. And now we have our rocket ship blasting off into space. Goodbye.
Bobby, that is so cool. I love how you added in those costumes at the end to make it look even even better. That's another good example of creativity and coding, right? Mm -hmm. I was like, I was just having so much fun exploring in Scratch. And then whenever I went through the costumes, I was like, I could do so much more with this. Absolutely. So, so would you talk a little bit about being an AmeriCorps VISTA and what that's about? So being a VISTA, VISTA stands for Volunteers in Service to America. Uh, I basically have a one-year contract and I have a service site. And so VISTAs are basically supposed to help strengthen communities um, through community service. And what I'm doing is I'm helping to build science and STEM outreach throughout West Virginia, also to help build up um, our robotics competitions, help to expand our robotics programs, and help to expand educational robotics throughout West Virginia to help areas who may not be able to afford that kind of education or to help families who can't afford that kind of education and to help bring um, those learning resources to those families and communities. And so I don't get paid very well, but that's kind of also like the point of being a VISTA because it's like, how can you go out and help people who aren't making a lot of money if you're also making like buku money? Absolutely. And, so, and I think, is there an education credit with it? There is. I get at the end of, you get up to two education service awards, which are a little over $6,000, which go towards your college. Um, it can go towards college debt or it can go towards your college um fees and whatnot if you're still in school. I've already graduated from college and so I'll be using those to help pay off my debt and after two years I'll have about half of my debt paid off from it. That's fantastic. Is, is this the only kind of job that a VISTA can have? VISTAs have jobs absolutely everywhere doing everything. There are uh, VISTAs who, trying to think, they help manage schools um, manage different programs in schools. A lot of the VISTAs that I work with um, at Education Alliance have maker spaces. And so they help to have these like building spaces for students where they can design and build with 3D printers and whatnot. Um, there are VISTAs that go out and just try to get funding for different organizations. Uh, you could do literally everything and travel everywhere with it. That's fantastic. And we so appreciate your service. We couldn't do all the cool stuff we, we do without all of our VISTAs. Um, Bobby is one. Van, who's running our cahoots, is another. Uh, Bobby's a good example of doing your year of service after you graduate. Van's doing his before he starts college. So there's a lot of flexibility there. And I wish I had realized what an option it was when I was, you know, thinking about going to school and what I was doing right afterwards. But yeah, if there are any questions, I am Absolutely. free to take some questions. Bobby, thank you so much. <laughs> we are going to be back in just a minute with another Kahoot. Um, and thank you all for tuning in. Hi everyone, I am back. I will be hosting another Kahoot. Um, once again, join from any browser, from any device at kahoot.it. Enter that game pin on top and your name should pop up on the screen as soon as you choose a name. I am more than welcome to accept any players from all around the world. Um, I'll give you guys a couple minutes and then we'll start. This time we are talking about the keyboard shortcuts on a Mac. So I know you guys that were on PC last time, you guys were kind of cheated out. Don't worry, you have Macs covered too. And I personally have never owned a Mac in my life. I've never touched a Mac. 
Um, I actually have an Apple sticker on my current laptop, and people think, and I put it on where the Mac logo, the Apple logo on a Mac would be. People often think that it is a Mac, but I have to, I have to tell them it's not a Mac. <laughs> Once again, we will be hosting a Kahoot on Mac Shortcuts. Just join this game pin 3480607 on any browser on any device. Just go to Kahoot.it and you should be prompted to enter a game pin. We'll be starting about a couple, uh, 30 seconds from now. How do you save your work on a map? We do only have three players in this, this game, so everyone here will place. Which is a win for all of us. <laughs> Cute Mama, the only one on the board. How do you close a window? Mama's still in the lead. What do you press if you're searching for a word? I have a feeling that Macs and PCs have very similar shortcuts. Mac app on fire right now. No, we'll. We only have two players on the board as of right now. Let's see if we can get that number up. How do you take a screenshot if you want the whole screen? Not just a tiny bit of the screen, the whole screen. One's across the board. The right answer is Mac Shift 3. 
Let's go excited possum on fire right now. How do you take a screenshot of a part of the screen? You just answered how do you take a screenshot of the entire screen? Now we just want a part. Max shift four. Only two players on the board. We have two questions left. You made a mistake. How do you undo it? Max Z, we have one question left. Two players on the board as of right now. How do you copy and paste my favorite, as you guys know, this is my favorite shortcut to ever exist. Max C and Max V. All right, we're moving on to the leaderboard. Interesting how Third place, we have a winner, even though it was three third places. And in first place, we have Excited Possum, followed by Cute Llama. Runners up, Witty Llama and Dynamic. I don't even know what Dynamic. Thank you guys for tuning in for this session of Kahoot. It was very fun uh, being your host once again. I'll see you guys next time.
Welcome to our final session of Kids Day in the Park Computer Science Edition. Um, if you haven't been to our website already, it's just in the um, description under the live stream. And when you click that link, you'll come here. If you hover over where it says sessions, we're the computer science session. And um, Paula and Morgan have developed a form to go along with their, um, with their session. So you can work alongside them designing your mission patch. And they'll tell you more about that in a minute. So if you wanna find it, you just scroll down here to where it says create your mission and then click on the link here and it will open up this Google form for you to work alongside. Um, so I'm going to turn it over to Josh Revels who I have the pleasure of working with at the NASA IV and VERC um, Educator Resource Center. And he's going to run this final presentation. Um, he has been just so involved with making Day in the Park come together and making it the amazing virtual event that it is. So you are in good hands. And um, with that, Paula Baker and Morgan Castles, both of whom work at the NASA Ivy and VERC, and we're just so glad to see you again, um, are going to walk you through a presentation about mission patches, Katherine Johnson and West Virginia in space. Okay, I think we are in the right place on your presentation now. Thank you, Emily, for this kind work. So, Paula, and we'll let you ladies take over. Okay, thank you, Josh. Okay, so hi, everyone. Um, today, Paula and I are going to be going over how to create your own mission for our activity today. Um, next slide, please, Josh. We are going to introduce ourselves. So my name is Morgan Castles. I am from West Virginia. I'm originally from Weirton, West Virginia. I went to West Virginia University and I graduated with a degree in industrial engineering. Whenever I was in college, I was a NASA intern. I had a really cool project where I um, looked at the effects of the last total solar eclipse on Earth. And after I graduated, I became a quality assurance engineer at NASA IVV. Um, and that's where I work currently with my coworker Paula. Next slide, please, Josh. Hi, everyone. My name is Paula Baker. And uh, as Morgan mentioned, we are colleagues at NASA IVV facility. Um, my hometown is in Los Angeles, California, but I have made uh, West Virginia my home. Um, and I love it here. Um, I have degrees in both electrical engineering and systems engineering. And uh, one of the most fun projects I've worked on in my career so far with NASA is the Mars Science Laboratory Curiosity Rover, which is currently on the Martian surface uh, taking measurements and samples. Um, my current position at NASA IBMB is as, as a systems engineer. And um, we're really excited to talk to you today, and we hope that one day we'll see you possibly at NASA IVMB. Uh, next slide, please. Okay, so this is the NASA Katherine Johnson Independent Verification and Validation Facility, also known as NASA IVMB. So this is where Paula and I work. Um, NASA IVMB was established in 1993, and it is located in Fairmont, West Virginia. There are about 270 employees at NASA IVNV, and the employees there, they independently assess NASA software systems. Next slide, please, Josh. So our facility is named after Katherine Johnson. So Katherine Johnson was born on August 26, 1918 in White Sulphur Springs, West Virginia. She went to college when she was only 14 and she went to West Virginia State College. Um, she was both a teacher and a mathematician, and she's so important because she calculated the trajectory for the first American in space, and she was also one of the first African-American women to work at NASA between the years of 1953 and 1988. And next slide, please, Josh, it'll bring up a new picture. 
Um, I just wanted to point out that they did make a movie about Katherine Johnson and her co-workers, um, and that movie was called Hidden Figures, so I just included the movie poster here. I suggest you all check it out. Okay, next slide please, Josh. So today we're going to be creating our own mission, um, but before we do that, I wanted to tell you all about one of my favorite missions, which is the Voyager mission. So the Voyager mission was comprised of two spacecrafts, and both spacecrafts um, launched in 1977 from Cape Canaveral, Florida. And they explored four planets. They explored Jupiter, Saturn, Uranus, and Neptune. And after they explored those four planets, they continued on in space, and they are now the most distant human-made objects in space. Um, the furthest of the two is now farther than 22.3 billion kilometers from the sun. That's really far. Um, next slide, please, Josh. So one of the things that makes this my favorite mission is that both Voyager spacecrafts have a golden record. Um, and this is a picture of the front and back of each of those golden records. Next slide, please, Josh. So those records are, they contain 115 images and sounds, and those sounds range from music to spoken greetings from 55 different languages. And the purpose of these records is to hopefully encounter some form of life in space. Um, and that information can be used to communicate. Next slide, please, Josh. So before we get into creating our own mission, um, we just wanted to mention that we will be going through the steps to create your own mission. You can follow along in the Google form that's linked here, or you can um, visit this link later and um, complete this after our presentation. Next slide, please, Josh. Okay, so for a moment, just imagine that you are a commander for an upcoming mission and your purpose is to search for life in the solar system. So to do this, you have to decide three things. You have to decide first where you're going. Second, you have to name your mission and third, you have to create your very own mission patch. So we are going to give you a little tour of the solar system so you can decide where you would like to visit in the solar system. Next slide, please, Josh. So the first object that we're going to talk to you about in the solar system is actually our own natural satellite, the moon. You're all very familiar with looking at the moon at night. Um, and it's actually 249,000 miles from the Earth. We've had uh, 12 humans so far a walk on the moon's surface, and we're hoping to send very soon uh, more people to the surface uh, to explore. Um, the moon has a very, very thin atmosphere, almost close to being a vacuum, but not quite. And it actually contributes to the rise and fall of the Earth's sea level, which we also refer to as ocean tides. Next slide, please. Okay, so next is Mercury. So Mercury is the smallest planet in our solar system, as well as the fastest planet in our solar system. Mercury is the closest planet to the sun at about 36 million miles from the sun, and it has no moons and also very extreme temperatures. So in the daytime, it can get up to 800 degrees, and at night, it can get as low as negative 290 degrees. Next slide, please, Josh. So Venus is actually kind of a, a sister planet to Earth in the sense that it's a, a similar size to our planet. It's the hottest planet in the solar system with a surface temperature of about 900 degrees Fahrenheit. And it's actually got 90 times the air pressure that we have on the Earth. Um, it's also 67 million miles from the sun and it has no moons as well. Next slide, please. So next is Mars. Mars is about half of the size of Earth. Um, and it also has two moons. Um, so Mars actually has one rover and one lander currently on the Martian surface that are active. 
And there are also three NASA spacecraft that are in orbit around Mars. Mars is about 228 million miles from the sun, and Mars has a very, very thin atmosphere as well. Next okay, I, I've got to actually have a question. So Paula, I'm going to go back to your slide on Venus. Here's a question that has been asked for you. Uh, when you say 90 times the air pressure than Earth's, could you explain more about what that means? So I guess the best analogy I could give for air pressure is uh, lower air pressure. Like if you're, if you're going to higher elevation, you're going to have lower oxygen levels. When you go up like a mountain, if you're hiking up a mountain, which is actually, uh, it's harder for you to breathe. Um, so with actually um, higher air pressure, which is what would be on Venus, it would presumably be easier for you to breathe if it had oxygen levels there, um, you know, for to sustain human life. Um, I think that's probably the best analogy I could give is, is uh, equivalent to something on the Earth's surface. Um, I'm not sure if you think maybe more you want to add to that, Josh or, or Morgan. <laughs> Yeah, I will say that in the past, they have sent rovers to Venus, not NASA, but other countries, and um, it actually got crushed under the air pressure. So it's really heavy, and it would be um, almost impossible for humans to survive there. Hey, thank you. Mm -hmm. We'll go back to the slide that I think. Okay. Okay, so our next planet we wanted to talk to you about is my personal favorite, which is Jupiter. Um, it's the largest planet in our solar system with 75 moons that actually have some conditions that may um, support life. Um, so that's, you know, one of the reasons why we go to these places and look at their moons um, and compare to our Earth. Um, there's actually a giant storm called the Great Red Spot that's been active there, um, at least as far as reporting um, by humans for over 360 years. Can you imagine if a storm on the Earth <laughs> was constantly going for 360 years? Um, and Jupiter is 484 million miles from the sun. Uh, next slide, please. Okay, so this is Saturn. Um, so as you can see, Saturn has these rings around it um, that are made of dust, ice, and rocks. And the atmosphere of Saturn is almost mostly hydrogen and helium. And Saturn also has 82 moons um, that have conditions that could also support life. And Saturn is 886 million miles from the sun really far. <laughs> next slide, please, John. So our next planet we're going to talk about is Uranus, and it's actually an ice giant planet um, made of water, methane, and ammonia. Um, it's actually the only planet in our solar system to spin on its side. Um, it has 27 moons, and it's about 1.8 billion miles from the sun, which, I mean, that's crazy far, right? And what's interesting about this planet is you can't see it in this photograph, but it actually also has rings um, around it as well. Uh, next slide, please. And lastly, we have Neptune. So Neptune is the farthest planet in our solar system. And it's also an icy planet that's made of water, methane, and ammonia. And it is 2.8 billion miles from the sun and Neptune has 14 moons. Next slide, please, Josh. Okay, so now that we have selected where you would like to go for your mission, um, next you will need to name your mission. So when you're selecting the name for your mission, you should select a name that is easy to pronounce. And some advice we have for you is to be inspired from your favorite characters from books, movies, TV, or history. Um, that's what NASA does. We're inspired all the time with our names for our missions. Um, so I have a little did you know here. 
Um, so did you know that the last four Mars rovers were actually all named by students? That's really awesome. Um, and we have some names below to help inspire you. So some of the names here are Spirit, Opportunity, Curiosity, and Perseverance. So those are all some of the names that NASA has used in the past. Next slide, please, Josh. Actually, can I ask you a question first? Yes, of course. Okay, so this is a question for me, and you may not know the answer to it, but that's fine. I noticed that all of these are robotic, uh, you know, rovers. Of course, mm -hmm. th that's the tie-in here to computer science, is that mm -hmm. uh, these missions are missions that rely heavily on computer science. And so does any aspect of that, I know that you said these were student names, but do, do computer scientists get to help weigh in on like coming up with mission patches? Oh, absolutely. So the scientists and the astronauts actually have meetings where they get to discuss the designs that they want to implement for their mission patches. Um, every mission is different. So sometimes the commander would take a huge role in this and sometimes it's a team effort. Um, sometimes if they don't have a lot of ideas, they bring in artists to help them. Um, so every mission is different, even with the mission patch process. Um, but yes, they are definitely inspired by the science and the computer science. Um, that's definitely a driving factor on how they design their mission patches. That is so cool. I want to design a mission patch. Well, we're getting there. So next slide, please. So the last step of the create your end mission process is to create your end mission patch. So astronauts wear mission patches on their spacesuits. Um, and like I mentioned before, each mission has a very unique and different mission patch. So this picture here has an astronaut with a ton of mission patches from all of the different missions that he was a part of on his arm. And so let's get into the steps on how to create your end mission patch. Next slide, please, Josh. Okay, so first, um, like I mentioned before, we have a Google form where you can complete this activity and you can actually submit your mission patches to us. Um, so we'll be going over that a little later, but for now, go ahead and grab a blank piece of paper and you can draw the shape of your mission patch. So every mission patch is shaped differently. The example that we have here has different orbits, it looks like in them. Um, so that's your first step is just to create the shape that you would like your mission patch to be. Next slide, please, Josh. And so the second step is to add the name of your mission. So we talked about how you're going to come up with the name and now it's time for you to actually add that name to your mission patch. So this is a mission patch for the upcoming mission Artemis. Um, Artemis is a mission where they will be going to the moon. So that's really exciting and that's an upcoming mission. And this is the design that they have unveiled for Artemis. Next slide, please. So the next step here is to add the names of the astronauts for your mission. Um, so we've assigned you commander, so you can go ahead and add your name to your mission patch. Um, but if you have any astronaut friends that you would like to join you on your mission, you can also add their names to the mission patch that you've created. So here we see that we have the four astronauts that were a part of this mission. Their names are around the border of that mission patch. Next slide, please, Josh. And the next step here is to actually add the location or the planet that you're visiting on your journey. Um, so this mission patch, it looks like they're going to the International Space Station. Um, and we actually see where they are coming from too, which is Earth. Um, so go ahead and add the planet that you selected to your mission patch. And next slide, please, Josh. And the, the last step here is to actually add your spaceship. Um, so this is an important step because every mission needs a boat of transportation. So this patch here, we see that there's a shuttle. Um, so they're proud of their shuttle and so they went ahead and added it to their mission patch. So um, yeah, go ahead and add your, your shuttle to your mission patch as well. Okay, next slide please, Josh. And like I mentioned before, we want to see the mission patches that you create. So go ahead and share your finished patches with us. 
Um, we have a Google form and in the Google form, there's an email where you can email the patches to us. And next slide, please, Josh, we have one more. And I'm gonna hand it over to Paula. So thank you, Morgan. And uh, thank you, Josh, for sharing those good questions with us. Um, we wanted to share another activity for all of you to do offline. Um, and we wanted to share the spot, the station website that NASA maintains where the International Space Station is on a trajectory and you can actually check to see where it is worldwide and you can see it from the US um, overhead as a bright object in the sky if you can track it. So we invite you to go to the website and find out where it is and determine when it's gonna be in your location and go outside and look for it. Um, we also wanted to share with you that there is a NASA SpaceX Crew-1 uh, mission on Halloween, October 31st, that is launching three American astronauts and one Japanese astronaut. And we'd love for on Halloween, if you all could tune into that and support your astronauts in their mission to the International Space Station. Um, with that, um, you know, Morgan and I really appreciate your time and attention. And uh, Morgan, I don't know if you wanted to have anything else to say or um, otherwise we were gonna hand that back over to the ERC. Morgan, do you have anything? I'm looking forward to seeing what you guys create. Um, and other than that, thank you everyone. Thank you very much. We're gonna hand it back over to Josh and the ERC folks who've done such a great job today. Awesome, thanks. Do you ladies have time for a few more questions? Absolutely. Okay, so uh, sure. I, I know that uh, you may not be directly involved with the International Space Station for your work. You probably have other projects that you maybe could talk more about, but uh, is the International Space Station, you know, reliant on computer programs or any type of software that folks, uh, you know, need to make sure that it's working correctly? Absolutely. Uh, there are many, many computer systems on the International Space Station that maintain life support systems and other systems to uh, communicate back to Earth. Um, so the astronauts, you know, I'm sure if you go on YouTube um, on NASA TV, you can see the astronauts are actually broadcasting to us and having a communication with uh, the ground system in a Johnson Space Center. Um, they're they're basically using technology and computers to talk back and forth. Um, and then additionally, those life support systems to maintain the right um, oxygen levels and uh, you know, basically keep the lights on and, and all of that, that is all being controlled by software on computers in the International Space Station. Morgan, <laughs> did you want to add anything to that or? Yeah, absolutely. So the ISS is still a mission that um, the IV and V facility works on. Um, every time there's updates, you know, we look at that software. Um, so software is very important. And like Paula said, we want to keep our astronauts happy and healthy and safe. Um, and that's what something that the software helps do. So um, it's very important and it's something that is continuously um, being improved as well and updated. Awesome. So uh, another question that we have is that since you work uh, for NASA, can you talk more about any of the projects that you're working on and what it's like to be you while you're working on any of those projects? And maybe what do you need to know while you're, you know, to do something like that? Yeah, absolutely. So um, I am a quality assurance auditor. And the nice thing about that is I get to actually get a peek into all of the projects we work on. So every month I um, audit a different project. So one month I will be working on the ISS and auditing them. Another month I might look at the Orion project. Um, so every month I get to look at something different, which is really fun. Um, but I would also like to say that that way I get to also learn a lot. So I talk to a lot of people and I meet a lot of awesome people like Paula. Um, there's always something to be learned from um, all of those conversations. Um, 
So if that's what I do at IVNV, Paula. Thank you, Morgan. I like working with you too. Um, I, as Morgan said, I get to work with great people um, like Josh as well. Um, I'm a systems engineer and I'm currently, currently on the space launch system, um, which is a heavy rocket um, that can carry a crew um, to the moon and potentially into deeper space. Um, before that, I actually supported um, the Antares rocket out of Wallops, which uh, delivers cargo ships to the International Space Station. Um, you know, Morgan and I, we take very seriously that, um, you know, we're supporting uh, astronauts out there. We're supporting um, economies across the country. We want to make sure things work. And uh, by looking at the software um, and making sure things are working correctly, um, we, we want uh, NASA to continue all these fun and important missions. So what did you have to do as a high school student or college student to help prepare you to do the types of things that you do? If someone wanted to become you, what, what could they like prepare themselves? How can they get? I'll go first. So um, I actually started working on a little, a lot of different NASA projects when I was in college. Um, so there is a NASA office at WVU, and um, I was really interested, and um, I worked with them on a lot of different projects. Um, so I got to um, build a student project where we developed software that was actually put on a payload, a NASA payload, um, on a NASA rocket. So that was really awesome. Um, I also was an intern, and so through that, I was paired with a NASA mentor um, who I learned a lot from, and um, I was able to navigate my own project um, looking at the health of vegetation on Earth during the total solar eclipse. Um, and a lot of other ways that um, I was kind of integrated with NASA throughout college. Um, so my advice would just be to um, do what you can when you hear about really awesome opportunities get involved um, because it just kind of takes that first step. And from there, there will always be more that you can, um, you know, be involved in. So if you hear about something that you want to do, just get involved. And from there, you kind of just continue on. Um, so I guess just to add to what Morgan was saying, I agree with everything that she said. Um, so for my personal experience, um, I actually didn't know that I wanted to be an engineer in high school. And now that I'm looking back, I volunteer um, with Josh and Emily and Ryan and all the folks in ERC um, with FIRST Robotics and, and VEX. And I would highly recommend that for the students out there that haven't looked into that, that you consider um, finding out more information on those teams because it's a way to get hands-on experience. And even if you don't decide to be a, a computer programmer or an engineer, you can build things. Um, so at that level, I would recommend doing, getting involved in some kind of club or group where you can build something um, and learn how computers work. And then at the college level, like Morgan, I also was involved with NASA. Um, my junior uh, year, I actually started my senior project. Um, and I was working with um, Jet Propulsion Laboratory, which is actually part of NASA, um, but they're actually funded by Caltech. So um, I built a prototype Mars rover as part of my college project. And even if your college doesn't have a project like that, you can buy for a couple hundred dollars, um, you know, find some donors to support you and buy you some of the equipment and you can make your own project and you just need to find an advisor to do that. So um, that actually helped me a lot to understand that I really did want to be an engineer and I, I really like what I do and um, I felt more comfortable building things after I actually built something at the college level similar to what Morgan did in working with NASA as well. And uh, you know, as Morgan said, WVU has a really good program uh, with a relationship with NASA IBNB. So right in your home state, um, and even, you know, for folks who are not in West Virginia too, but 
Um, in West Virginia, there are a lot of resources. So I recommend you check those out, just like she said. Thank you. And yeah, you can find all the information about uh, those erotics competitions that Paul is talking about at the West Virginia Robotics Alliance website. So search for WV Robotics Alliance if you want to get involved. Thank you so much for being here today and sharing your knowledge and giving us an insight uh, of what it's like to, and, and who can be uh, a computer scientist. And so thank you. I'm very interested and, and I can't wait to learn more from you both as as we continue to work together. And I agree, I, I love working at uh, NASA IV and V in Fairmont, West Virginia. I, I actually didn't know it was there until I started working there and I've lived 10 minutes away from it just about all of my life because I was born three years before it was established. So uh, <laughs> I hope that uh, those of you out there watching realize that there are opportunities in the STEM field for you right here in West Virginia. And uh, you can work with Paula and Morgan maybe in the future. You could become their co-workers. So uh, with that, I'll, I'll go ahead and close things out. Remember, we have one more live day uh, this Friday. In the morning, we'll be doing energy as our, our session topics. We'll have an all-new keynote speaker for that with some more sessions following it. And then in the afternoon on that day, uh, we'll be doing climate. So we'll have, again, another climate keynote presentation and then some more sessions that you can join afterwards. So we hope to see you guys join us uh, and check out our website for more activities that you can do in the meantime. Thanks. Bye.